of the Zoom window. If you don't see your question appearing instantly, it's normal, but it will appear, just give us a few minutes to process the questions. We've been taking all security precautions. Um, Zoom offers to protect the webinar from being hacked. However, we cannot guarantee a 100 protection from hacking. So please note that, the, that in the event of a hacking incident, and we sincerely hope it will not happen, we will Im immediately terminate the webinar and resend an invitation without registration this time to all participants with a different link and password. We will then resume the meeting after a 10 minute break. Finally, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that, I will be in, that it will be made available online after the event. So now it's time to formally launch the meeting. Thank you um, for the partners. Elena Lai, Secretary General of CEPI, the European Audiovisual Production Association and Derville Murphy, Deputy General Secretary of FIA, the International Federation of Actors. Derville, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daphne. Yes, I'm Derville Murphy, and I work for the International Federation of Actors, representing performers worldwide. FIA is one of the four trade union partners in the Audiovisual Sectoral Social Dialogue Committee and in this project. Together with the other trade union federations, our sister federations, FIM, UNIME, and the EFJ. And I'd like to welcome all of you on all of our behalves. At the opening of this webinar, I'd just like to begin with um, a little word about the background to, to this event. It's the final event of a joint project, which stretches back over more than two years, and which arose out of a joint and shared commitment to improving gender equality in the audiovisual sector across the EU through social dialogue and through the kind of practical solutions that social dialogue can deliver on the ground. This commitment was formalized in 2011 through the signature of the Joint Framework of Action on Gender Equality by the European Social Partners. And that framework of action detailed recommended actions and approaches to tackling and improving gender equality in the sector. After some time in 2017, the Social Dialogue Committee agreed that it would be timely and appropriate to look at progress made in the sector and to try and identify recent initiatives, the trends in the sectors, and to generally take stock. Well, this resulted in a joint project by all social partners, employers and trade unions together, and a mapping exercise which aimed to identify good practice and deliver a better understanding of the current state of play on gender equality in the sector across the EU and to bring those findings together. It was actually further agreed at that time that it would be both useful and enriching to extend the scope of the mapping beyond the original scope of the framework of action. The framework of action was focused on gender equality, but all social partners felt that the good practice gathering should also take in practices pertaining to diversity, and achieving a better diversity in the audiovisual sector. And all of this work resulted in the excellent report that we're happy to launch today. And I'll hand over to Elena to say a few words about that. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Because we are experiencing some uh, technical problems, but I hope you can hear me okay. Here I am. Thank you very much, Derbal, and welcome to everybody. I represent uh, CEPI, which is the European Audiovisual Production Association, and uh, I'm just uh, going to echo a lot of what uh, Derbal has already said, because this project for two years has been a real synergy between the trade unions represented in the social dialogue and the employers associations. I am here representing the producers today, but there were other producers associations working with us and with the trade unions like FIAP, for instance, and the broadcaster side from the public and private side as well, so EBU, ACT, 
the radio sector and that tells you the level of uh, importance all the stakeholders gave to this project during these two years. And uh, the project started with a lot of mapping exercise, which was uh, not uh, something that comes as a surprise, if I can say so, because there are a lot of examples out there that are crucial for gender and equality policies and for diversity, and that it is important to disseminate and to kind of uh, raise awareness of uh, with uh, not only the typical stakeholders operating in the industry, but with many other uh, areas of the sector as well, where they can be crucial. And I have to say that today to map the, the sector uh, was uh, difficult because there was so, so much out there that even to create this handbook and to collect the, the best practices was, was tough. But we managed, thanks to the work of our uh, director, Daphne Tepper, and the work of all the stakeholders involved, you will see today a lot of good practices that uh, will uh, help you to understand how to raise awareness of the issue, how you can better monitor at national level what is going on, how you can set target, because at the end of the day, we found out that it was important also to to facilitate a more safe environment uh, for women operating in the sectors and for men operating in the sectors as well. So it was a common, um, a common joint uh, effort, this one. Um, one thing that is important to also raise is that it was not only um, uh, a mapping that involved what happened in the industry. A lot of our um, best practices come also from a clear a synergy we had with the public funding and, and understanding how public fundings are also treating this, uh, this issue nowadays. So you will have to keep that in mind as well. And the European Audiovisual Observatory too has been involved in a lot of gathering of data. So I think there is uh, quite a lot to discuss today. But before to, uh, to pass the floor uh, to my colleagues, I would like to introduce somebody who has followed very closely our sector too from DG Employment. It's Sigrid Kaspar from the sector Social Dialogue. And she knows the commitment that all the organizations have put in, into this project. And we hope that uh, this project will be an inspiration at the national level and will be used by a lot of people to see how to better address uh, certain issues in the future. So I would like to pass the floor to Sigrid. Thank you very much to all for the attention to this seminar. Thank you very much, Ellen. Elena, for these uh, nice introductory words. And uh, I thank the social partners for their invitation to give this opening, to say these opening words. Um, Daphne and the social partners have put a lot of efforts in this, in the preparation. And I think you have chosen a very timely topic. It's super timely. We have gender equality, which is also in line of the COVID crisis, we have seen the question going on whether this means a backlash. And we are also seeing the diversity discussion now having gained a huge importance linked with this discussion about racial discrimination. So super good timing, but perhaps you shouldn't expect something else from people who are so experienced with media as the audiovisual sector. I think we all know that discrimination as such is bad. And we also know that prejudice and stereotypes are to a large extent very often quite tempting. So this makes it so difficult to fight it. And it's not a short term race, but it's a marathon. And it always appears in new forms and in new shapes. So this might also have been a reason and link to the statement that the union has for itself, it's united in diversity. And uh, I think it's a good 
motto and it might also serve for the purpose of this workshop. So what are the consequences of discrimination or what are the phenomena linked to discrimination? Different biases in recruitment, gender pay gaps, class ceiling, exclusive working patterns. So the request to ask too long hours or um, exclusive or home office is only something for yeah, certain groups of people. You shouldn't ask for home office once you are really serious about your career. I think this has massively changed over the last few months. And there is also the aspect of hidden networks all around. So to be clear, there is a personal dimension to discrimination and inequality where colleagues and just the staff, but also the citizens do not consider equal treatment as appropriate. And there is a bias towards, well, you shouldn't expect a woman to do that, or you shouldn't expect a, a guy to do this or that. So this is in all of our minds. And here, I think it makes the topic so much interesting for social dialogue. This is not just between workers and employers, it's also for the discussion of between employees and between workers and between different parts of the management to actually consider what is discrimination and how far can we go, how far, sh what should we actually do to avoid that. Having said that, I think we should also be clear that over the last 20, 30, or perhaps even a bit more years, we have gone quite some distance over the time. If you imagine for those who are a bit older, 30 years or 40 years ago, to have a female moderator in a sports show. Well, football is for man and a woman should not interfere on that. Or having a female referee in a first league match or having a female speaker of the main news of the day. These are achievements which we do no longer consider wonder about. It is good that this happens, but we have to go on. And I'm happy that the social partners are investing in this effort and they are doing it jointly. And uh, I wish this webinar therefore all the success and all the attention of all the participants. And in that sense, before passing on to Davne, who is now going to present the main results of the report, I would like to request from all the participants to put aside the smartphone, which we all tend to use quite frequently during these webinars or uh, video conferences, to put to not check your emails for the next hour, but to listen to the discussion and to get involved via the Q&A function. This is far too important to do multitasking. So thank you and I pass on to Daphne. Thank you very much, Sigrid. Um, your presence today, your insights into the European agenda and into the topic of today, your continuous support to our work, as well as the support to your, of your team is extremely appreciated, really. So, so thank you for being with us today. So before I start, I will just um, share with you a PowerPoint I prepared. So bear with me a second. OK, so I think you are seeing my presentation. So um, before moving to the roundtable and to the contributions of all other distinguished speakers who have accepted to be with us today, we wanted to present you uh, the highlights of the Good Practices Handbook that the project partners and the European Social Partners have been working on uh, for the last two years. As mentioned before, this publication is the result of a mapping exercise launched by the European Social Partners as a follow-up to the framework of actions on gender equality adopted in 2011. As Elena said, this mapping exercise has been implemented in several phases. First, a desk research to try and consult as much as possible of the existing literature related to gender equality and diversity in the European audiovisual sector. Second, an online survey 
sent out to all the members of the project partners in the different European countries. So on the employer side, public and private broadcasters, national association of producers, and on the worker side, national trade unions representing off-screen workers, performers, actors and musicians, and journalists. Finally, interviews were held during study visits in different European countries and over the phone. The key, the key questions that guided our research were the following. What is the state of play regarding the presence of women on screens and beyond screens and sets in Europe? Is the sector fair to women in terms of pay, opportunities, career prospects? Do television, radio and film productions reflect our European societies? What has been put in place to combat discrimination and promote equality, inclusion and diversity in audiovisual organizations and workplaces? What is working and what is missing? How could we go further and what support is needed? The conversations we had the chance to have with different actors of the European audiovisual industry in different EU countries were extremely interesting. And I would like to thank once again all the individuals who took the time to speak to me in the last two years to explain in details the whys and hows of their work in the gender equality and diversity fields, to share their experience and expertise, but also their interrogations and their hopes for the future. I would also like to pay tribute to the amazing work done by associations and networks across Europe to produce statistics, push the gender equality agenda, and put in place tools and programs that have had an incredible impact on the audiovisual landscape in the last years. I'd like to mention, for example, EVA, the European Women Audiovisual Network, Procorte in Germany, FC Gloria in Austria, the Collective 5050 and the Lab Fan de Cinema in France, El Tourne in Belgium, CIMA in Spain, and I'm sorry if I forgot more organizations. They have managed to impulse change and move lines, and hopefully we will continue walking the path they opened, they opened in the years to come. So the Good Practice Handbook has two main sections. The first one presents the general context in which gender equality and diversity fits in with general statistics on women representation in the European workforce, on the gender pay gap, and an overview of the relevant EU legislative framework, as well as the specific sector context. What initiatives have been taken in the European audiovisual sector in the last years in the field of gender equality and diversity, what statistics are available, etc. The report does not present a comprehensive overview of the gender statistics available in the different European countries, as it is very complicated to collect and collate, but it presents a sample of those statistics with the, aim, with the aim of highlighting the key trends, but also on, um, at identifying what information is missing and what would be interesting to produce more regularly in the future. What the report shows is that in a large majority of cases when data exists, for example, on women in key positions in film productions that receive public funding, or on women's presence on screen as monitored by some national audiovisual regulators, or on women in management positions in media organizations, there is still an important inequality between men and women. It also shows that progress is slow, except when there is a strong will and a big push, such as in some countries where film funding bodies have taken the lead or where public service media have put gender equality as a priority on their agenda. In the second part of the report, we highlight interesting practices implemented by a large spectrum of audiovisual stakeholders, big and small, from across Europe and at different places on the creative value chain. What we wanted to show is the range of actions that audiovisual stakeholders can take 
to improve gender equality and diversity on and on, on and off screen and air. What we also wanted to show is the importance of understanding and addressing the different dimensions of gender equality, the unconscious biases, the structural discriminations in recruitment, the gender pay gap, the unbalanced caring responsibilities between women and men, and the impact on career progressions, etc. We wanted also to make sure that all aspects are worked on on the relevant levels. We grouped the good practices on gender equality in five sections. Of statistics, targets, monitoring and reporting when designing and implementing gender equality strategies and action plans. Gender equality strategies without targets or gender equality targets without monitoring have proven of poor effect. But on the contrary, we have examples of strategies that have delivered impressive results in sometimes short period of times when ambitious targets are set and when numbers are followed up closely. In the second section, we look at campaigns and actions that have been developed by audiovisual stakeholders across Europe to rare awareness, organize training, and com training, sorry, and commit organizations and people to change. In a third section, we highlight the role public funding and public organizations can play to encourage the audiovisual sector to transform some of the traditional patterns that lead to imbalances. The specific role of field funding bodies and of public service media is features with an overview of the catalogs of actions that have been experimented by those organizations to promote gender equality and sometimes diversity in different EU countries. In the next chapter, we look at some initiatives taken in the sector in the aftermath of Me Too to combat sexual harassment. By doing so, we highlight how promoting safe work environments and addressing the underlying inequalities and unbalanced power structures revealed by sexual harassment element of any gender equality strategy. In our last section, we show how through small steps, the audiovisual, the audiovisual sector can change the way it works on a daily basis to achieve genuine and quality front. Here, we present concrete tools and schemes implemented across Europe, such as databases of experts with diverse sets, commercial incentives to women-led projects. Finally, the last chapter presents some practices implemented by audiovisual stakeholders across Europe to promote diversity. In the conversations we held across Europe in the last two years, it was obvious that diversity is now also firmly on the agenda in May and that the work done to achieve gender equality should be seen as a driver for enhancing other types of diversity on our screens, on, on air, and beyond, behind screens and mics. Diversity understood as ethnic, cultural, social, or ground, sexual orientation or disability is of course a complex issue that cannot be counted in most EU countries as easily as the presence of women and men. The lack of diversity is, however, a reality in the audiovisual sector, as, is as in many other places in our societies, and the role of the sector in the creation and distribution of content makes it even more relevant for us to address and work on this issue. So the handbook presents some interesting practices developed by different types of stakeholders to diversify the audiovisual workforce in terms of social origin, ethnic backgrounds, sexual orientation, and to enhance the presence of colleagues with disabilities. This is, however, only the beginning of the work 
and we hope to continue the discussions on this crucial issue in the months to come. So, in a nutshell, and I have already been very long, this is the key results of the work on gender equality and diversity that has been implemented by the European Social Partners in the last two years. We sincerely hope it can inspire more stakeholders from across Europe to take actions in this field and that it will feed, and that it will feed the discussions sector stakeholders will have with European and national policymakers in the coming months and years. To finish, I would like to thank once again all the project partners and their members for their support and commitment during the last two years. I would also like to acknowledge the skills and talents of the two women who have helped me prepare this publication. First, there is Yasmine Gatou, an extremely talented artist from France who has created the beautiful original drawings that illustrate the handbook. And then Laurence Dierix, the graphist and, graphist and web designer who, while working on this publication, also managed to defend her PhD in information and communication sciences. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions on the handbook, don't hesitate to type them in the Q&A uh, section or to send me an email. Now it's time to give the floor to the distinguished speakers who have accepted our invitation to take part in this webinar. Thank you all again for your presence, for your time, for your efforts. I very much look forward to the discussion. And dear friends, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I hope you all can see me. Welcome, everybody. Uh, well, I think it's a wonderful topic we're sharing and uh, I hope you all are inspired to take up all challenges around diversity, especially in this time. I think it's uh, amazingly how urgent it is. Uh, we don't only have the Corona time, but we also have a sort of emancipation in the Black Lives Matters. And I see this really as an opportunity uh, uh, to, to, to break open this whole discussion around diversity, gender, all kinds of, of stuff. A little bit about myself. I'm the head of diversity of a Dutch national public broadcaster, already 10 years active in this field as head of diversity, also in the European uh, movement, so to say, in the European Broadcasting Union. We are trying up to set co-productions. We are dealing a lot with diversity and as you all know it's quite difficult, it takes a long time, it means a lot of pressure, it means a lot of time people have to speak out and uh, but I think this is uh, what what is happening in Europe, happening in the world. Change will always bring pain and, and will always bring discussions and I think uh, that makes us stronger. Well, for me, it was perhaps the last two years the most enlightening moment, uh, the whole vision around unconscious bias. I think that unconscious bias is the instrument to break open the diversity discussion. Diversity is always talking about someone else, about minority or whatever, while unconscious bias is talking about yourself. So we, we, it's about what's happening in your head, how you, how you perceive the other persons and how, how you look to the world. Um, the, also, I think this project, uh, this European project, the handbook Daphne just explains to us, can inspire us all. And in the handbook there are wonderful best practices, uh, which we will share with you the next one and a half hour. Uh, we have a, a lot of persons you will see, uh, everyone gets 10 minutes and we will talk with them uh, about what they do and, and how they do it. And I think it's a wonderful kaleidoscope, as they say, about uh, what is possible and how people are dealing with all gathered uh, for this. Well, let's first go to uh, my dear colleague Claudia Vacherone from the EBU. She is the head of diversity programs for members of the EBU and Claudia can explain she is I think well like one and a half years already trying
to set up this project in European broadcasts and in the EBU. But Claudia, perhaps you can enlighten us about everything what you do and the gender equality project you are running at the moment. Let's see if Claudia... Hello. I yes, very need... good, Claudia. <laughs> can you see me or do I need to put... No, the... we cannot see you, so try to, to set up the video. Okay, sorry. But otherwise... Here we go, yeah, sorry. There you are, <laughs> very good. Well, the floor is yours. Absolutely, thank you very much, Franz. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. I would like to start by thanking uh, Mrs. Sigrid uh, Kaspar, the leader of Sectoral Social Dialogue, DG Employment European Commission, for fostering the dialogue about the imperative of gender equality and diversity in media and keeping the topic high on the European Commission agenda. We will need more of this support. Also, thank you to the social partners and Unime for having us today. Um, we would have all liked to meet in person uh, in Brussels as it was foreseen, but uh, we are grateful that technology allows us to convene at least virtually on such a fundamental topic. And also I would like to congratulate Daphne Pepper on the excellent handbook uh, published and all the teams involved, uh, which is a timely, actionable and very com complements very well our report that we'll be talking about in a moment. And uh, I really hope it will be used actively by media companies, members of the individual sectors to have an impact, to engage concretely uh, and pragmatically for gender equality. Enough talking, let's do things. So the been working actually um, on the question of gender equality for a long time with its many passes. Actually, France here has been leading also a group of EBU members who have produced over time toolkits, papers, and great content. Um, but I would say that in the I've seen has been enabled also by political momentum. I joined EBU in uh, 2018, just a little bit uh, over two years ago. And uh, when Tony Hall, who was at the, you know, who's a uh, the president of the EBU, he immediately launched an executive board sponsored initiative inviting members to collectively step up efforts toward gender equality in public service media. And it must be said that public service media is probably the most advanced sector within media already. Uh, in fact, we have some data, we know that 45% of staff of our members in Europe are women that represents a collective workforce of 110,000 women. And 27% of our members are led by a woman director general. 27%, that is a huge proportion. If you, I think that we have a slide that shows a little bit, I'm sorry, I forgot to say next slide, <laughs> Daphne. There's a slide that shows some of this data. Um, if Daphne can kindly put it up. Uh, so 27%, um, a little further, Tony Hall. Well, uh, this one. Thank you, Daphne. So, um, you see, for comparison, with the sector private, there is a 9% of female CEOs. It's six percent. So, we already have a very strong um, cohort of role models. But we're still not at 50-50. Uh, there's still several cultural roadblocks to address you know, systemic issues that we started to hear already from Daphne, um, whether it's harassment, bias, stereotypes, discriminations, you know, all these things that are plaguing also our industry. We also know from uh, industry studies in several countries now that women are seen and heard only 30% of the time on average. Um, and this is no longer acceptable. We are 50, 51 percent work anymore. So making the case for gender equality was relatively easy. You know, diversity values of public service media, and it's become evident the need to be able to tap onto all of the uh, onto all of the talent which is available to secure the needed pivoting and innovation to the intrinsic need to represent all audiences and secure the accrued creative diversity. So the way we pro progressed, we had 11 members from throughout the region 
stepped up a little over a year ago and uh, we formed a steering group that in a very short time and worked uh, with agile methodologies identified some of the best practices throughout the ebu members that is the best policies which are in place from an organizational standpoint so we really focus more in-house we haven't addressed yet the on-screen representation part um, but the, you know those policies that have proven really efficient uh, in concretely improving or reaching even gender equality. Some of our members actually are even you know in the position now of having more female uh, than more more women than uh, than men even in management position, but they are a minority. We looked, of course, at the uh, at the usual suspects. You know the Nordic countries who have a long experience on the matter. Uh, like one of our member uh, from Iceland, Ruv, which has close completed the gender pay gap, uh, has full parity, or Swedish radio or the national broadcaster in Sweden, SVT, uh, both recently receiving prestigious awards uh, nationally, recognizing their journey towards gender equality in areas traditionally very, very um, male dominated, like sports and, uh, and uh, broadcasting technology, um, where we know that there's a, there's a huge, huge discrepancy and emergency to intervene and to balance the, uh, the, um, the numbers. We also clearly talk to the Anglo-Saxon, like the BBC or CBC Radio Canada, who have uh, strong and decade-long uh, policies. But we were surprised positively to discover innovative and, and aggressive policies in many other countries as well. Um, just to give you some examples, um, Georgian public broadcaster, for instance, in Georgia has been running some really phenomenal campaigns and they're working really hard on developing internal tools. Um, in Spain, RTVE has been worked relentlessly in, uh, in a very focused way on leadership development and then, you know, working on their own internal culture. Um, so it was uh, as usual when, you know, in the typical EBU style, when having this bird eye view all over, you know, very different regions and very different countries, it was extremely inspiring and educational. We realized that each member reckoned with different starting points and different cultural contexts. So the perfect recipe is not easily identifiable. There's not a one size fit all uh, way to go about it. However, some clear common threads and, uh, emerged, some uh, minimum viable denominators, and they've been captured and illustrated in the All Things Being Equal report. Next slide, please, uh, Daphne. Um, which has been shaped as an actionable tool uh, and provides a precise roadmap for media companies, regardless of their maturity level in terms of gender equality. Um, and the guidelines are relevant both for the C-level uh, and for the operational layer. And they're also complemented by 21 case studies and 18 pro tips from our members. Those are tactics that, you know, provide the um, concrete examples of, of what these policies mean. The report is uh, available uh, to everybody. À tout le monde. Vous pouvez le télécharger sur le site web de l'UE. Uh, Ils peuvent nous tous appeler à nous contacter et le partager avec le handbook de from, uh, from Unime. Um, so this roadmap, the roadmap that the report, you know, illustrates, identified two macro areas. Next slide, please. Um, that need to be addressed from an organizational standpoint. Uh, policies on one hand and culture um, and you know we realized that basically uh, those those media companies that had reached equality they had worked in parallel on both of these dimensions in you know with the same level of attention and the same level of scrutiny um, so under policies if we have if I can have the next slide please under policies, we have uh, um, identified three key areas. One is data, uh, one is the alignment, and then you know specifically policies. For the data side, we heard it from Daphne as well before. Um, it's the it's the need to start from an assessment, which is objective. They need to have you know to start from something concrete. And I remember when we were researching, talking to Magnus. Uh, Torderson, then uh, Director General of RUV in Iceland, who said that, you know, the data for us was fundamental. It takes the emotion away. You know, it helps to really start from an objective number and understand where the inequalities are, where the, uh, the, the uh, disequilibrium is. And from there, 
set targets and then you know work on it basically so what you know what kind of data are we talking about it really depends upon you know the company culture but at minima at minima there are some uh, gender indicators you know that are available to all hr departments we actually also spell them all out in our report um, which is the breakdown you know between men and women in all different dimensions, you know, totally, you know, between staff and between management, by department, uh, between full-time staff and uh, uh, non-permanent staff, and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So by mapping this, you know, the those those pie charts start telling a pretty clear story. And then there's quantitative data, and then there's qualitative data. There's also the fact that you know you can also complement, and you should, you know, companies should complement. Um, this data with um, qualitative elements and feedback coming from staff and this can be done in many many ways it can be surveys which are run with uh, with staff it can be focus groups where you know you start uh, hearing the individual stories that you know give a sense to this data and understand where the roadblocks are um, so you know that's the, the 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 starting point that we strongly recommend to everybody uh, then alignment what does it mean alignment means that you need to have when you launch this type of program and pursue this type of goals well we need to make sure to have everybody on board you need to have women you need which normally don't have an issue with that on the contrary they're very motivated you need to have men as well you know you need to make sure that you know men in the company don't feel that all of a sudden these programs are all about the women um, but it's a you know cultural change which is taking place and you need the leaders you need leaders aligned on board you need their buy-in so that chapter explains um, you know how successful companies have obtained this alignment basically um, and then policies um, and then you know why as I said before why do we need policies they there are the rules you need to have um, you know specific written out um, desirable behaviors and also undesirable one spelled out you need to be clear um, by talking to to all the members that we spoke to we identified next uh, six families of, uh, of policies if I can have the next slide please um, and then you will see them in the report we uh, we there's a nice chart that really uh, outlines very clearly for each family what does the policy look like um, you know there's a values clearly uh, there's the whole issue of process transparencies you know you know whether it's hiring process whether it's promotional processes you know how is you know evolving where and how how this decision to take place uh, what are the criteria um, there's a whole chapter, you know, on policies on leadership development, very important. Um, clearly, you know, the whole issue of remuneration, uh, then policies on work flexibility, and then, you know, policies on the working cultures as well. Um, so the report, you know, goes into, into in depth, into this part. And at the same time, uh, if I can have the, the next slide, please. Um, as I said, you know, beyond the policies, you also need to work on the cultures because you can write the rules on a nice document which sits on your intranet, but then if you don't work into enacting it, informing your staff, you know, and especially um, uh, inhabit these policies with your day-to-day -day behavior as leaders, as management, as staff, then, you know, you just, nothing really happens. So culture, what is it? It's the sustainable element and the glue that will keep the organization together. And it's basically how people behave and treat each other. Um, it's the employee experience. Uh, so we address three specific areas um, where, uh, where culture manifests itself. Uh, one is, you know, work-life balance and work flexibility, uh, which as we heard has been, you know, highly accelerated this year by the COVID crisis and 2020 will be a pivot year as companies now will finally integrate new policies of working from home and, and et cetera, that will accommodate also the lives of the employees. So it's gonna be, I think, a very interesting year from that standpoint to see how things will shape up and what are the impact then on, on uh, staff and on people as, as, as human beings and how they can live a more balanced lifestyle. Um, then we have uh, the second part, which is the, the fifth chapter, which is on eradicating toxicity. Um, so all those proactive processes to identify biases and harassment and the gender pay gap and then 
um, you know, some of our members, they've gone through a certification process, for instance, uh, with PwC or with Edge. We had actually one of our members, RTS, here in Geneva last week announcing that they got the second level of the edge uh, certification so um, these are very useful processes that help and support the leadership team um, moving toward the right direction um, and then the last one is the gender pay gap and uh, i'm sorry yeah that's what we just talked about um, so we also spell out uh, if i can have the next slide you know as i'm sure we will hear today i don't want to spend much too much time on this because we i'm sure a lot of the other panelists will want to talk about it but it's about okay once you have these two elements you still need to set goals you know have some metrics um and then you know make sure that you create accountability and you go back frequently to check on those metrics to check on progress and if progress is not there you make the effort to understand why um so as france said before it's a really like a long-term process uh, it requires a lot of stamina a lot of motivation um i remember also another conversation with catherine tate who is um Director General of uh, CBC Radio Canada, who said, "Without metrics, nothing happens." You know, there was she was really, um, you know, enough of the report. So we published it in December, um, and uh, as I said, it's available to everybody. Uh, but ever since, also, we've been doing several other things. Uh, we set up a top leadership program um, that would leverage the guidelines. Um, and on one hand, address the director generals, and then on the other hand, also the operational layer of gender and diversity officers and leads in our members. And why, as I said, because, you know, in order to achieve change, you need to have both aligned and empowered. And in this sense, I would like to stress, you know, as I said in the beginning, we had, you know, Tony Hall's involvement. And because of it, it's been a really concrete and tremendous example of leadership buy-in and executive sponsorship, which are both essential to enable, you know, to enable change. Uh, we also set up a mentoring framework uh, for leadership teams uh, that wanted to implement um, the guidelines. So we're currently working closely with three of our members, three organizations in three different uh, geographical regions. It's really fascinating. They're all developing their own implementation of the guidelines and we're supporting them in, uh, in accelerating process. four languages at the initiative of four members uh, in German, French, Italian, and Georgian. And I'd like to also thank um, the Bavarian broadcaster BR who led the German version, Rai for the Italian, and uh, um, the Georgian public broadcasters for the Georgian version. They also uh, launched an impressive campaign in, uh, in the world, involving the world media ecosystem there. Um, so that, you know, why did they translate it so that, you know, so that in their country, other media companies could benefit from it and also their own teams could benefit from all the findings. Finally, we have built also a community of over 200 gender and diversity professionals. Um, the operational layer is a new profession, actually. You know, we've been seeing now more and more titles in media, like gender equality officer, equal opportunity officer, head of diversity. Um, you know, some are coming from the HR profession, but not only, sometimes they are coming from journalism or from communications and marketing roles. Um, and they all need resources, they need a community to exchange with and to keep learning and nurturing each other. So this is what we are attempting to do. Um, we have been holding calls with them on the COVID-19 gender and diversity implications, as well on the Black Lives Matters movement. And we look forward to keep on servicing them with tools, networking, opportunities, and resources. And lastly, we have run a campaign on social media via the hashtag. You have to be already almost 20 minutes, Claudia. So oh, sorry, please wrap it up. It up. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so just the hashtag, you know, PSM for equality. And the aim is uh, to celebrate success stories of our members, inspire each other, and, uh, you know, but also the media industry at large and to show the way and motivate those that are starting the journey. So join us via the hashtag, get in touch. We're looking forward to a new initiative and continue this journey. Thank you very much and sorry for the overlay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, and I know I just have a question. Uh, who would you think that in Europe, who are the champions, so to say? Are that like always in this kind of field, the Scandinavians? 
it, it depends upon what the criterion. If you want to just, you know, sure, the Scandinavians, they, they, they are performing particularly well, they're very knowledgeable, but because they started, you know, a long time ago, and I think that they have also a um, societal context, which was extremely inducive. You know, they had laws, they had a societal debate, but, you know, which is not there yet in some of the countries of our members. And that's the roadblock that they have. It's not that they don't want to, um, you know, they're, they're ready to implement uh, a lot of these guidelines, but then, you know, there are some legal roadblocks because just the legislation is not there or they're just the culture is not easy to, um, to stimulate because this, you know, societal debate is still not there. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, just say the Nordics are good and the rest are bad. What we found out is that there's a real nice patchwork. There's a lot of, as I said, different starting points and also different excellencies. As I said, you know, we, we found out a lot of great examples coming from, you know, all over the region and uh, which was really um, uh, comforting as well. Okay, but like yesterday, uh, yesterday was in the news that the BBC invests Yes. This is Tony Hall, of course, 100 million. Yes. I think that is one of the key points. You have to invest in it. Because Absolutely. a lot of public broadcasters, they make reports, they have some offices, but I don't know if they really invest in it, in training schemes, in, in uh, hiring people, in really uh, making the targets prove, making them work. Absolutely. I mean, I can certainly confirm um, they're, they're really, yes, and, and, and clearly the BBC also benefits. It's, it's the, in, public, in, uh, in, in Europe, it's the uh, public service media with the biggest workforce and the biggest also funding and financing. So it's, the, you know, it's, uh, they have more resources compared to some of the smaller ones. But they're very serious about it. I totally confirm. And they're to the point that also they hired a whole team and they have someone, June Sarpong, who's leading uh, creative diversity. But they also have Anne Foster leading on the um, workforce diversity. So they have this in-house, on-screen dimensions, you know, really well uh, identified, mapped out and working together. Their, their new strategy. So there's, and, and then there's money on the table now, you know, to respond mm. to the world diversity and Black Lives Matter issue, which in the UK also, it's particularly uh, sensitive because of the uh, social demographics there. So yes, they're definitely like a good, uh, a good one to, uh, to, uh, to follow and also for the 50-50 um, uh, initiative as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, Claudia, for your uh, contribution to this webinar. Well, let's go on to Amal, Amal El Garbi. She's the project coordinator, uh, gender and diversity of the Association of Professional Journalists. Amal, are you there? Perhaps you can join us now and tell us a little bit what you are doing and what is your best practice in Belgium? Hi, everyone. I will be Hello. speaking French. Okay, so. Okay, I'm that's good. Daphne, if it's ready for the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, cool. Perfect. Donc, euh, donc je suis Amal Elgarbi, chargée de projet euh, Genre et Diversité à l'AJP. Donc l'AJP, c'est l'association des journalistes professionnels. Euh, c'est une union professionnelle euh, basée à Bruxelles en Belgique. Donc moi, je vais présenter l'outil Expertalia qui a été créé en 2016. Donc c'est un outil c'est une base de données d'expertes et d'experts issus de la diversité à destination des journalistes qui leur permet justement de diversifier leur source d'information, mais également qui permet aux expertes et aux experts d'avoir plus de visibilité dans l'espace médiatique. Donc avant de développer davantage sur l'outil Expertalia, je vais faire une brève présentation des différentes actions et projets de l'AJP en termes d'égalité et de diversité. Euh, des, donc, ce sont des actions euh, sur les dix dernières années avec le soutien de la Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles. Suivant. Donc, euh, la JP a participé, a participé à, à la publication du GMMP en 2010, donc le Global Media Monitoring Project. Euh, il s'agit de la plus grande étude internationale euh, sur le genre dans les médias. Euh, également, avec le soutien de la Direction de l'égalité des chances en Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles, l'AJP a publié en 2011 un baromètre euh, égalité et diversité en presse quotidienne et a également euh, publié l'étude la, la diversité au sein de la profession de journaliste. Suivant. En 2013... Euh, uh, the uh, profession of a journalist. 
Or, das wieder in einem äh, mehrjährigen Kriminalis, nach der Pupovlu. Le GMNP, donc le GMNP a lieu chaque, euh, tous les cinq ans. Uh, en 2014, elle a publié le baromètre Égalité et Diversité et alors en 2016, elle a créé Expertalia. Mais je reviendrai plus tard, plus longuement. Suivant. Donc, en 2018, um, la JP a commandé deux études. La première est Être femme et journaliste en Belgique francophone, uh, étude réalisée par les chercheuses Florence Lecam, uh, Manon Libert, Lise Ménalc. Um, la deuxième, c'est la représentation des violences sexistes et intrafamiliales dans la presse écrite belge francophone, réalisée par les chercheuses Sarah Sepulcre et Manon Thomas. Uh, cette étude-là a donné lieu à un flyer de recommandations sur le traitement journalistique des violences contre les femmes. Suivant. Donc récemment, dans le cadre d'une convention triannuelle avec la Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles, nous sommes en train de travailler sur quatre projets, donc le maintien et le suivi d'Expertalia, Euh, en 2019, la JP a publié son dernier baromètre « Égalité et diversité » et nous sommes actuellement en train de travailler sur une campagne sur le sexisme dans la profession qui vient à la suite de l'étude « Être femme et journaliste en Belgique francophone » et nous travaillons également au développement d'une plateforme à destination des étudiants et étudiantes et profs en journalisme pour justement les sensibiliser aux questions d'égalité et de diversité et pour qu'ils puissent euh, screener leurs travaux sous le prisme de l'égalité et de la diversité. Suivant. Donc, Expertalia, c'est une base de données d'expertes et d'experts issus de la diversité. C'est un outil qui a été euh, créé pour répondre aux déficits et aux carences observés en matière de présence des femmes dans la formation, mais également des personnes issues de la diversité d'origine. Donc, l'axe choisi, euh, c'est l'expertise. Donc, les baromètres et les études ont toute leur importance parce qu'ils nous permettent de, de constater qu'à l'heure actuelle, Encore, les intervenants, le profil type d'experts qui interviennent dans les médias, ce sont des hommes blancs d'un âge euh, mûr, donc entre 40 et 50 ans. Pourtant, ce ne sont pas les profils d'expertes femmes et d'experts issus de la diversité qui manquent. Donc, Expertalia vient recenser et présenter justement ces femmes expertes et ces experts issus de la diversité. Euh, elle tire aussi son inspiration des travaux réalisés euh, antérieurement, donc notamment la base de données par nos collègues de la VVI en néerlandais. Il euh, y, y a aussi également déjà la base de données euh, luxembourgeoise et l'outil de la BBC Expert Women. Euh, pour la petite anecdote, Expertalia vient du mot donc expert et alia euh, vient du, genre, du, du grec et du latin pour signifier différent et euh, c'est également la signification en arabe du mot illustre. Suivant. Donc, euh, Expertalia a été mis sur place euh, en 2016 sous la coordination euh, de mon ancienne collègue euh, qui était coordinatrice euh, genre et diversité à l'AJP, Alima El Haddadi, que je salue. Euh, également sous la supervision euh, de Martine Simonis, qui est la secrétaire générale de l'AJP. Et alors, nous avons aussi un partenariat avec la RTBF, qui est le, notre média public, qui a, une, euh, qui a développé une cellule diversité. Donc, le partenariat, c'est notamment pour euh, les médias coaching. Donc, les expertes et experts issus de la diversité qui sont euh, inscrits sur notre plateforme Expertalia ont accès euh, à des médias coaching gratuits trois fois par an. Parce qu'on s'est rendu compte qu'une des raisons qui explique la réticence des profils euh, d'expertes femmes et experts issus de la diversité, c'était aussi le manque de préparation et cette euh, crainte de passer à l'antenne ou de passer euh, à la télé. Donc le média coaching, c'est vraiment pour les aider à être le mieux préparés et à accepter de passer en interview. Euh, donc voilà, suivante. Actuel, donc en, 2000, en 2017, euh, on comptait 350 experts et expertes, euh, donc 90% de femmes et 10% d'hommes, et on comptait 228 journalistes inscrits sur Expertalia. Euh, actuellement, on compte plus de 550 experts et expertes, toujours dans le ratio 90% femmes et 10% d'hommes, et plus de 500 journalistes experts. Euh, plus de 500 journalistes inscrits, pardon. Donc, euh, il y a trois différents profils euh, d'experts et d'expertes, académiques, professionnels et associatifs. Euh, on compte également pour les spécialisations ça va des médias, de la santé, de la politique, du sport, etc. Suivant. Donc, ces 15 grandes catégories de spécialisation sont elles-mêmes subdivisées en dizaines de sous-domaines. Et donc, en fait, le moteur de recherche d'Expertalia, il est très intuitif. Il fonctionne soit par mots-clés, soit par domaines prédéfinis ou par région. 
suivant. Donc, ce qu'on retrouve sur une fiche d'expert ou d'experte, c'est donc les données d'identification, le nom, le prénom, euh, la photo, les domaines d'expertise, le descriptif euh, de l'expertise, de l'expertise, donc le, le parcours, le background, le CV, les publications euh, pour les pour les profils, par exemple, de recherche, les liens vers les réseaux sociaux, les vidéos, publications, etc. Euh, alors, on s'assure aussi que donc, les journalistes qui sont inscrits dans notre base de données, on veille bien à vérifier leur euh, identité. Euh, et donc, ce, ce ne sont que les journalistes qui, ont, qui sont inscrits et vérifiés et validés qui ont accès aux données personnelles euh, des experts et expertes. Suivant. Donc, par exemple, si en tant que journaliste, je cherche... Euh, un profil d'expertise euh, dans la thématique, par exemple, du genre. Je vais aller sur la base de données Expertalia, je vais taper le mot genre, et alors je vais... Expertalia va m'offrir toute une série, toute une liste de, de profils d'expertes femmes et experts euh, hommes issus de la diversité dans cette thématique-là. Donc c'est assez facile, c'est assez intuitif, c'est vraiment facile d'utilisation. Et je tiens à préciser aussi que euh, Expertalia, c'est gratuit, euh, tant pour les experts et expertes que pour les journalistes. Suivant. Donc, euh, bien sûr, ce n'est qu'un début. Donc, nous continuons la collecte d'experts et d'expertes. Euh, euh, profil enregistré dans notre base de données. Euh, nous continuons l'animation du site. Donc, euh, ça passe par la publication d'actu, d'agenda d'événements. Euh, on fait euh, la valorisation des experts et expertes. Donc, on, nous faisons la promotion de leur profil en postant euh, sur le site internet, sur les réseaux sociaux, via les newsletters. Nous poursuivons également les médias coaching euh, et la production de vidéos. Donc, à l'issue de ces médias coaching, euh, des petites capsules euh, vidéo pour chaque expert et experte est produite. Et donc, euh, ces personnes peuvent utiliser ces vidéos pour leur promotion. Pour leur... Et on les retrouve dans les fiches d'experts et sur notre chaîne euh, YouTube Expertalia également. Donc, moi, je vous invite à aller visiter notre plateforme Expertalia, donc expertalia.be. Euh, si vous êtes un expert ou une experte, donc si vous êtes une experte ou un expert issu de la diversité, euh, je vous invite à vous inscrire. Et si vous êtes également un journaliste ou une journaliste, je vous invite à, à vous inscrire sur expertalia.be. Et alors, euh, pour toutes les, toutes les études, les baromètres, les différentes actions et projets de l'AJP en termes d'égalité et de diversité, je vous invite euh, fortement à visiter notre site site internet, donc ajp.be slash diversité. Merci beaucoup pour votre écoute. Ok, thank you, Amal. Uh, Amal, I just uh, have a question. I, you, I think you, you said that uh, the, the databases are running for more than two years. Uh, do, you, do you see already results? Do you change that there are more women experts in the Belgian media, you think? Oui, euh, donc la base de données, elle a été créée en 2016. Et donc déjà, on voit une forte augmentation des inscriptions, que ce soit des experts et des expertes, mais aussi des journalistes. Et donc, on a de plus en plus de journalistes qui ont justement le réflexe d'aller dans la base de données et euh, interroger, par exemple, plus de femmes et plus de profils issus de la diversité. Donc, ça fait son chemin, oui. OK, but, but as we see in all investigations, it's quite difficult uh, to get more women experts on the screen and it's developing very slowly. Eh? Uh, why do you think that is? L'un des problèmes principaux euh, qui répond pour, pour expliquer en fait ça, c'est que justement euh, les journalistes ont tendance à être plutôt dans l'entre-soi. Donc c'est plus facile d'interroger quelqu'un qu'on connaît ou un expert qu'on connaît. Et donc justement, euh, ça doit vraiment venir d'une initiation personnelle, d'une initiation euh, collective aussi dans le, dans le média. Donc c'est pour ça qu'à l'AJP, on, on essaie vraiment de faire la promotion d'Expertalia le plus possible. Et c'est vrai que ça fait son chemin. Donc maintenant, de plus en plus de journalistes nous disent « Oui, euh, ben, on va sur Expertalia et, et on doit encore faire vraiment plus de promotion d'Expertalia. » Mais il y a vraiment un entre-soi. Et on l'a vu aussi particulièrement durant la crise du Covid. Euh, généralement, les profils qui ont été interrogés, ce ne sont pas des profils. Peu de profils femmes, en tout cas pas assez, et peu de profils issus de la diversité. Donc c'est vraiment à cause de cet entre-soi. Il faut justement pousser la promotion de l'outil et, et continuer à, à le développer. Ok, thank you very much, uh, Amal. I just want to say to all the participants that uh, you can ask questions to Claudia or to Amal or who you want. We, we gather them and uh, after. Uh, 
uh, our talks. After a while, we get Valerie, but after that, we have 20 minutes to, to, to talk about all the questions and you can put it in a chat and then Daphne will bring them together. Well, Amal, thank you very much. Very good. Go on with the good work, I would say. Uh, okay, we go to Valerie, Valerie Lonquille. She is the HR director of Canal Plus, the, the, the commercial uh, television group in France. Uh, um, Valerie, uh, I would say, uh, bring up your best practice. Good afternoon. Hello. Can I just say sorry to interrupt? Um, thank you very much to the first two speakers. Can I just remind you to, to speak slowly? Uh, please, because of the interpreters, um, I've been told they are running uh, after the presenters. So uh, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I'm I'm leaving now. Very good. <laughs> so, okay, Marie. So good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be with you to share Canal Plus Group. Um, a 360 degree um, approach in terms of gender equality. As my time slot the quote is quite short, I prefer to speak in French. So uh, I apologize for it, but I, I think it, it will be uh, more comfortable for me to, to, um, to share with you uh, the most of it. Daphne, uh, peut-être, voilà. Um, Avant de rentrer dans, dans, dans notre politique d'égalité professionnelle, euh, peut-être que je peux partager avec vous quelques mots euh, sur le groupe Canal+, pour ceux euh, qui n'auraient pas une, une vision extensive euh, du groupe. Donc Daphné, peut-être le premier slide. Le groupe Canal+, est, est, est un des, des grands leaders euh, de audiovisuels européens, qui est une filiale du groupe Vivendi. Et nos principales activités se structurent autour de trois grands, trois grands thèmes. Nous sommes éditeurs de chaînes de télévision euh, essentiellement payantes, donc thématiques. Et nous avons aussi des, des chaînes de télévision gratuites euh, en France notamment. Notre deuxième activité, c'est l'agrégation et la distribution de contenu au travers de partenariats euh, importants, notamment avec Netflix, Disney+, euh, Being Sport, et également la création de contenu, euh, notamment au travers de notre filiale Studio Canal, puisqu'on produit une trentaine de films par an et que Studio Canal euh, possède un des plus grands euh, catalogues de films euh, au monde, avec plus de 5000 titres euh, qu'on commercialise dans l'ensemble des territoires. La spécificité du, du groupe Canal+, c'est sans doute son modèle euh, généraliste, puisqu'il euh, est articulé autour de quatre piliers éditoriaux, les films, les séries télé, le sport euh, et euh, les émissions de flux et, et, et de divertissement. Et puis, autre euh, euh, élément important, euh, Canal+, a, a, a opéré une transformation majeure vers le digital, vers le tout digital. Et aujourd'hui, notre application euh, MyCanal est une des euh, principales applications leaders euh, sur l'offre de télévision euh, digitale et qui est disponible dans de nombreux pays et sur tous les, les devices. Daphne, peut-être le, le slide suivant Dernière chose sur le groupe Canal+, parce que malgré notre très forte empreinte française, on est avant tout un groupe international avec un très fort ADN européen. On est présent dans plus de 40 pays. On compte plus de 7000 collaborateurs d'une cinquantaine de, de nationalités. Et on a le plaisir de servir plus de, de 20 millions d'abonnés de, de, dans le monde. Voilà, c'était pour vous, vous redonner le cadre euh, général de, de, du groupe Canal+. Euh, les éléments que je vais vous partager euh, maintenant sur, sur la politique euh, d'égalité professionnelle euh, entre les femmes et les hommes au sein du, du groupe Canal+, euh, viennent d'un constat qu'on euh, qu a fait au, à l'été 2018, hein, donc il y a une, deux petites années, avec notre président du directoire, Maxime Saad. Je vais revenir un peu sur l'histoire parce que, euh, en fait, c'est cette historique qui euh, sous-tend nos convictions fortes sur le sujet. Et je pense que vous allez retrouver des, des éléments que euh, Daphné ou, ou, ou Claudia ont déjà partagés euh, précédemment dans les interventions euh, avant. En fait, Canal+, euh, globalement, a toujours été très ouvert à la diversité. Très, euh, ça faisait un peu partie de notre culture et de notre ADN. Et finalement, en fait, le sujet est abordé de façon... Euh, 
très pragmatique et morcelé. Il n'y avait pas vraiment de politique euh, euh, structurée. Euh, on était euh, une, entité, une, une société assez, euh, assez jeune, euh, tournée vers l'audiovisuel, vers la modernité. Et en fait, on, 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 ça la reposait beaucoup sur des initiatives personnelles qui allaient euh, globalement dans, dans, dans le bon sens, mais qui n'étaient pas structurées et articulées par, autour d'une politique euh, construite. Et puis en 2015, vous le savez peut-être, notamment pour les participants au webinaire qui sont basés en France, en 2015, le groupe Canal+, a, a, a connu une, un changement important de gouvernance euh, avec l'arrivée d'un nouvel actionnaire de référence. Et donc, c est, c est, ce changement de gouvernance s'est accompagné d'un changement d'organisation, des renouvellements d'équipes, et puis également euh, euh, le démarrage et le lancement d'une profonde transformation du groupe vers plus international et vers plus de digital. Et donc, on voit aujourd'hui euh, les premiers résultats sur, euh, sur les slides que, que je viens de vous présenter. Tout ça pour vous dire responsable à la survie euh, euh, du groupe de, de Canal Plus et, et de sa transformation, c'est traduit par des changements dans les équipes et puis peut-être aussi une moins grande focalisation, une moins grande disponibilité des équipes RH et du management pour suivre et se préoccuper de sujets euh, d'égalité professionnelle. Et donc, pour revenir à l'été 2018, euh, nous avons fait un bilan de la représentation des femmes euh, avec Maxime Sada, donc le président du directoire, et on a été extrêmement surpris de constater que sans, sans le vouloir et, et, et sans l'avoir vu venir surtout, la part des femmes dans le top 100 du groupe avait perdu 10 points. On était passé de, 34 pour, de 44% à 34%. Et donc, ça, ça a été un peu le, la, la prise de conscience. Et Daphné, peut-être que vous pouvez passer euh, au slide suivant. C'est ce constat-là qui est à l'origine en fait, de notre politique. On a poursuivi par un, un, un suivi et des études quantitatives euh, plus approfondies pour mettre en évidence que euh, la représentation assez équilibrée au global des femmes, puisqu'elle représente 47% de l'ensemble de nos équipes, en fait, dissimulait des disparités assez fortes selon les métiers notamment au sein des journalistes, puisqu'elles ne représentent que 31%, ou même des métiers de la technologie et de l'IT, où elles représentent moins de 15% des collaborateurs. Et donc, c'est ce, 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 cette quantification, cette mesure, qui a une double conviction avec Maxime Saada, c'est que, un, ce qui n'est pas mesuré n'existe pas. Et on n'avait pas suivi d'indicateurs et on n'avait pas vu la transformation ou le retour en arrière très fort qu'on avait connu en deux ans sans s'en rendre compte et sans que ce soit la volonté de, de, de quiconque. Donc, ce qui n'est pas mesuré ne peut pas être piloté. Et la deuxième conviction, c'est que pour faire changer les choses, il faut piloter, suivre, avec vraiment beaucoup de régularité, puisqu'on avait régressé en moins de deux ans euh, en relâchant l'attention. Donc, nos deux convictions qui sous-tendent toutes nos actions, c'est on mesure et on suit et on pilote par une série d'actions qui nous permettent d'ancrer dans la, dans la durée. Alors, à partir de ce constat, on a construit notre politique, euh, et c'est le slide suivant, qui s'articule, en fait, et qui, qui vise avant tout à passer d'un constat d'une réalité qui était euh, une réalité tangible de la diversité de nos équipes, nos équipes hein, au sein du groupe Canal+, à une politique d'inclusion beaucoup plus construite et, et pilotée. Elle s'articule autour de trois objectifs euh, qui, qui sont assez classiques, hein, que j'imagine qu'on retrouve dans, dans un grand nombre d'entreprises, qui sont lutter contre toutes les formes de discrimination et mettre en place, s'assurer que nos process euh, sont absolument irréprochables en la matière, premièrement. Deuxièmement, contribuer à renforcer la prise de conscience et la visibilité des minorités dans nos équipes, mais aussi, et j'y reviendrai, sur nos antennes, sur nos contenus. Et puis, le troisième axe important, c'est qu'en tant que média, on a la conviction que nous, a, nous devons et nous pouvons avoir un impact fort sur notre écosystème au travers des contenus à l'image, 
on doit avoir un rôle euh, qui permette de renforcer la présence des femmes, de lutter contre les stéréotypes euh, et de donc promouvoir euh, une égalité euh, plus forte euh, pour les femmes et pour les minorités. Cette politique, elle s'articule et, et elle, euh, elle euh, s'oriente sur cinq priorités dont les femmes font partie, puisque ça représente la moitié de la population, mais qu'on décline également sur la diversité des origines, sur la santé et le handicap, sur les, sur les LGBT+, et sur les questions d'âge. Et puis, troisième grand principe important, et c'est peut-être ce qui fait notre caractéristique par rapport à ce que j'ai pu voir dans dans d'autres entreprises ou ce que j'ai pu déployer personnellement dans d'autres entreprises dans mon passé, c'est qu'on a adopté une approche 360 degrés. On considère que l'égalité des genres ou la lutte contre la discrimination et les stéréotypes n'est pas qu'un sujet RH et n'est pas qu'un sujet en direction de nos équipes et de nos collaborateurs. C'est un sujet qui concerne tous les métiers. Et ce n'est qu'à cette condition-là qu'on peut avoir un impact positif sur notre écosystème. Donc, on a construit trois grands comités qui réunissent des représentants de tous les métiers de l'entreprise, y compris les éditoriaux, les RH, les fonctions transfert sous métier, les commerciaux, et qui s'articulent, alors c'est des noms en français un peu humoristique, mais qui s'appelle « État sœur » pour l'égalité de, des genres, euh, qu'on pourrait peut-être traduire comme « Hey, why are you your sister euh, ?» et « Ton frère » pour tous les autres sujets de diversité. Et, et euh, le troisième, c'est « Et ta planète » pour notre responsabilité sociale et environnementale. Et dans tous ces comités, ils sont pilotés par le top management et en particulier par Maxime Saada, on a des mis en place des objectifs et des KPIs qu'on suit euh, et qu'on monitor dans la durée. Et chaque membre qui représente son métier est le responsable, et à la fois sponsor des actions, et le responsable de son plan d'action concernant son métier et pas uniquement les RH. C'est vraiment ce qui, ce qui fait la, la clé de notre, de notre approche. Après, ce que je vous propose, j'ai deux slides où je peux vous partager quelques initiatives RH et puis euh, quelques initiatives hors champ des politiques RH. Alors, les premières actions qu'on a mises en œuvre, vous allez retrouver sans doute les, les, le cocktail habituel de, 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 des, des politiques déployées dans, dans, dans les entreprises qui euh, sont attentives à ces sujets. Euh, sur notre premier axe, qui est lutter contre la discrimination et, et, et mettre en place des, des processus, notamment RH, irréprochables, Bien sûr, on a déployé une procédure anti-harcèlement qu'on a discuté avec nos instances représentatives du personnel et qu'on a communiqué à l'ensemble des équipes. On a conduit des workshops de sensibilisation auprès de l'ensemble du management. Et puis, nous avons signé la charte Stop au sexisme ordinaire en entreprise qui nous permet aussi d'impulser, de garder une dynamique en la matière. On a revu l'ensemble des processus RH avec les équipes RH et notamment, on a mené une, une campagne de formation pour tous les RH euh, autour de la prise de conscience des stéréotypes inconscients, de tous les biais inconscients, euh, de telle manière à pouvoir, euh, en tant que RH, être sensibilisé sur les filtres euh, psychologiques qu'on peut mettre euh, à la fois en termes de recrutement, en termes de gestion de carrière euh, ou d'accompagnement des collaborateurs. Et puis, la question des écarts salariaux est un sujet important aussi. Et donc, depuis deux ans, nous avons mis en place une enveloppe budgétaire dédiée et distincte des autres enveloppes salariales, dédiée au rattrapage des écarts inexpliqués entre les femmes et les hommes. Le deuxième chantier important qu'on a mené et qu'on continue, c'est de renforcer la place des femmes dans les populations dans lesquelles nous avons une sous-représentation des femmes. Parce que je vous rappelle, on a globalement une... Notamment, nos deux axes prioritaires sont l'accompagnement et l'accélération de l'accession des femmes aux postes à responsabilité. Donc, nous avons un dispositif qu'on appelle Booster et qui accompagne pendant plusieurs mois une, une promotion de vin au potentiel chaque année. Et puis, nous avons des actions spécifiques concernant les recrutements des femmes dans les métiers de technologie et informatique.
Et puis, sur, sur les impacts sur notre, notre, notre écosystème, on a construit avec nos, nos talents en maison, euh, nos, nos présentateurs et nos humoristes, des vidéoclips sur le main spreading, le main, main interrupting, etc. pour sensibiliser nos, nos collaborateurs. Ils sont accessibles sur notre plateforme digitale. Nous avons aussi développé des, euh, des workshops de, de vision de réalité augmentée euh, de telle manière à vivre comme si on était euh, le témoin et, et celui qui, qui expérimente euh, des comportements sexistes. On travaille sur la prise de conscience. Euh, et puis, on travaille et on sensibilise et on encourage l'application euh, de l'écriture inclusive parce qu'on pense que ça fait aussi partie des, des, des moyens de transformer euh, et de faire prendre conscience de combien notre façon de penser, notre façon de parler, d'écrire est genrée, en fait. Et puis, on a des, des conférences assez régulières sur le sujet. Ce qui est peut-être plus intéressant, c'est le, le slide suivant qui est sur, en dehors des initiatives RH, quelles sont les initiatives mises en place par les autres filières métiers. Et la plus importante, je pense, est la charte qu'on a conçue euh, et qu'on déploie actuellement auprès de tous nos partenaires pour la production de films, de séries télé et à partir de septembre 2020 pour euh, nos partenaires euh, qui produisent des, des émissions euh, de divertissement. C'est une charte très simple qui tient en moins d'une page mais dans laquelle on les sensibilise et on leur demande de s'engager à la fois à, à, à promouvoir des femmes euh, et avoir une approche paritaire dans leurs équipes donc derrière, sur les plateaux, donc derrière euh, la caméra, d'assurer des conditions euh, de travail euh, et de tournage euh, respectueuses, hein, notamment euh, quand on a des, des, des scènes dénudées ou des scènes euh, compliquées. Donc, on, on, on leur demande d'être extrêmement, extrêmement vigilants euh, sur ces sujets-là. Et puis, on leur demande aussi euh, d'être vigilants sur les rôles modèles et sur la représentation des femmes et, et des personnes issues de la diversité dans des... Euh, dans des rôles d'autorité classiquement occupés par des hommes blancs et non issus de la diversité. Donc, de lutter contre les stéréotypes. Et donc, on annexe à chaque contrat et à chaque lancement de production externe cette charte. On a d'autres actions qui concernent nos programmes et nos antennes, que ce soit la promotion des, des, des talents féminins, notamment au sport. Et comme vous savez, les journalistes sportifs sont quand même à dominante masculin. Et donc, on a, on a une action spécifique chez Canal+, depuis de longues années maintenant, pour promouvoir des journalistes femmes dans ces métiers à dominante masculine, masculin. Euh, on a des programmes spécifiques sur, sur, sur nos antennes. Peut-être aussi un point sur la période de Covid et, et qu'on vient de, de passer, le, donc la, la, la gestion de, de cette crise euh, sanitaire qui n'est pas totalement derrière nous. On a sensibilisé euh, nos, nos équipes de journalistes pour euh, veiller à avoir des femmes parmi nos expertes. Alors, on n'est pas à la parité, loin de là, hein, et on a encore beaucoup de chemin à faire, mais on poursuit nos actions de, de sensibilisation. Euh, Peut-être un dernier point sur, euh, je ne vais pas tout passer en revue, mais euh, les équipes marketing hein, ont aussi euh, travaillé à, à faire évoluer leur offre, la manière dont elles s'adressent à nos abonnés euh, en ayant une écriture qui ne soit pas genrée. Et peut-être que là, je, je, je vais essayer d'aller plus vite. Donc, euh, une écriture non genrée. Euh, les équipes de la régie publicitaire ont travaillé sur des euh, segments publicitaires non genrés pour sortir euh, du segment de la ménagère de moins de 50 ans. Voilà, donc chaque métier, ce qui est important est à retenir, c'est que chaque métier a pris le sujet et scanne euh, son activité au regard de ce filtre-là. Dernier point pour finir, euh, on a fait un tout petit bout du chemin. Euh, on, on poursuit donc avec un objectif, c'est le slide suivant, de continuer à mesurer, parce que c'est vraiment notre conviction, si on ne mesure pas, euh, on ne pilote pas les, les actions et on ne les ancre pas dans, dans, dans la durée, et d'internationaliser, c'est-à-dire de décliner dans chacun de nos pays, en ne tenant compte bien sûr des spécificités locales et culturelles, 
euh, de chacun des, des territoires. Donc, on, est, euh, on a fait un bout du chemin et surtout, notre objectif, c'est de ne surtout pas relâcher la pression et de rester sur nos trois convictions qui sont euh, engagement de la direction générale, pilotage et mesure euh, régulière par les comités et les KPIs et une approche 360 degrés qui nous permet d'avoir un impact non seulement en interne, mais aussi sur notre euh, écosystème externe. Voilà en résumé. Okay, thank you, Valérie. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is you have this charter. Uh, what do you do if there is a series where there is very less diversity? Can you influence it or do you evaluate it later? Uh, how do you really intervene in the content process? Alors, euh, cette charte, elle est partagée en amont euh, de la production. Quand je parlais tout à l'heure des, des productions de Sieux Canal ou notre label Création Originale, euh, les, les, les équipes éditoriales, hein, qui ne sont pas du tout, euh, pas du tout dans mon, mon champ de responsabilité euh, RH, euh, travaillent les scénarios propose des ajustements, euh, encourage euh, ou réécrive, en tout cas avec les équipes euh, euh, en charge des productions, les, euh, les personnages euh, de telle manière à, à, à veiller à, à éviter les stéréotypes. Donc, il y a, une, il y a un travail, c'est plus de l'influence et du travail de collaboration en amont dans l'écriture des scripts et des personnages. Euh, voilà, c'est... Cette charte intervient avant même le lancement des, des, uh, de la production. Okay, so but, but does it happen if you look to? I, I'm I'm not much watch very much the Canal Plus programs uh, here in the Netherlands. But if you watch to the programs, you think there is a lot of diversity on the screen now. Do you think it works? All your efforts? Alors, je ne vais pas vous dire aujourd'hui qu'on est à 50-50 euh, sur l'ensemble des, des, des personnages, hein, ou des... mais je crois que vraiment, les, ce qu'on appelle nous nos créations originales, qui sont vraiment les, les, les productions euh, de séries télé, par exemple, de, de Canal+, on a vraiment des personnages euh, euh, et des séries un peu emblématiques dans lesquelles les femmes et les, les personnes issues de la diversité ont des rôles emblématiques. Euh, vous avez dans lequel vous avez une présidente de la région qui est une femme en France on n'a jamais euh, mais on a euh, voilà c'est une, une des illustrations une autre illustration euh, c'est euh, la série Les Sauvages dans lequel on a un président de la République issu euh, d'une minorité Là aussi, nous n'avons pas, euh, nous pas euh, connu ça euh, en France. Donc, c'est deux exemples. Et il y en a vraiment plein d'autres. C'est-à-dire qu'on veille dans toutes nos séries qui occupent des postes euh, de magistrats, de euh, policiers, de, euh, de médecins. Euh, voilà. Donc, c est, c est, on a la conviction que c'est en avant euh, ces personnages-là qu'on peut être une vitrine de la société, qu'on peut contribuer à nourrir des représentations différentes et à apporter une petite pièce dans le dispositif global de l'évolution des, des, des représentations. Mais là où je vous rejoins, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de choses à faire et qu'on est au début de l'histoire. Et okay. uh, last question, then. If you talk, this is all about gender, eh? and if you talk about ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, because there's, as we know, there is a lot of division and inequality in France with all these banlieues. And do you think there is improvement in that way? Because that will be probably quite tough. No. C'est une question difficile, notamment pour la France, euh, de se dire est-ce que ça s'est amélioré Parce que vous savez qu'en France, euh, ce genre de statistique est interdit par la loi, contrairement à d'autres pays. Et, et il y a tout un débat aujourd'hui euh, en France sur la mesure euh, de la diversité, puisque euh, nous, nous partageons la, la conviction que euh, ce qui n'est pas mesuré, sur lequel nous n'avons pas de data, euh, il est extrêmement difficile de faire prendre conscience et donc de, de, de suivre des progrès. Donc, euh, je ne suis pas en capacité aujourd'hui de vous dire 
si ça s'est amélioré de, et, et dans, quel, dans quel pourcentage. En revanche, ça fait partie d'un de nos axes prioritaires qu'on a démarré après celui euh, du genre, donc sur lequel on est moins avancé, euh, mais sur lequel Canal+, a toujours eu euh, là aussi euh, euh, une approche un peu naturelle et un peu désordonnée, pas, non pilotée. On a des émissions et on a une très forte représentation parmi nos talents euh, de, de journalistes et de présentateurs issus de la diversité, mais qu'on ne suit pas en tant que statistique. Et là aussi, je pense qu'on peut le raccrocher à ce que je vous disais en, en introduction. On a une approche aujourd'hui euh, issus d'initiatives personnelles et, ou individuelles et une culture générale bienveillante, mais elle n'est pas structurée autour d'une politique archi, voilà, structurée, pilotée. Et c'est ça notre ambition, c'est de passer d'un du, constat de pratique à euh, des indicateurs, des objectifs qui nous permettent justement de suivre euh, de façon sérieuse et d'ancrer euh, solidement. Donc on revient okay. toujours à mesurer et de pouvoir euh, suivre. Yeah, well, very good. I would say continue your courageous work. Merci. Uh, I am just now uh, looking to Daphne. Daphne, are there questions in, in uh, present to our uh, to, to to Amal or to Claudia or to uh, Valérie? I'm just looking at. Eh? Yeah, well, actually, both Claudia and Amal are so efficient that they answered in writing already oh. some of the questions <laughs> asked. So they're saving time for us. Um, there is still a question about um, awareness raising. And uh, I guess if I understood correctly, um, how do you raise awareness also of women, of the um, uh, stigmatization and on the Uh, cultural uh, assigned roles um, and I think it's a very broad uh, and so societal questions and, and I don't know if, if one of the of the speakers would like to um, uh, take that up um, but otherwise um, I think uh, Valérie Valérie, yeah, yeah okay Peut-être partager quelques éléments sur notre programme Booster hein, puisque c'est un programme de, de, de coaching à la fois individuel et collectif et en fait, un des, des objectifs, c'est la prise de conscience euh, du, du sujet euh, et, et donc de d'éveiller et de développer la prise de conscience des, des femmes vis-à-vis euh, -vis à la fois de leur environnement, mais aussi de leur propre euh, schéma auto-limitant qu'elles ont euh, progressivement euh, euh, développé. Et donc, l'objectif, c'est vraiment de révéler leur leur potentialité et de leur permettre de choisir. Notre objectif, ce n'est pas de leur dire il y a un schéma euh, tout fait euh, et vous allez toutes euh, euh, évoluer vers des fonctions de, de, de direction générale, de top management. Mais notre objectif, c'est de leur donner confiance, de euh, leur révéler leurs talents et de leur, euh, les autoriser et de leur montrer qu'elles en sont capables si elles le souhaitent. Donc, c'est vraiment un travail à la fois euh, individuel et collectif, et collectif, pardon, euh, d'accompagnement de, 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 et, et, et de awareness, de, de prise de conscience. Euh, et ça commence notamment par quelques éléments de, 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 de partage quantitatif avec des data, des, euh, un, un retour un peu théorique sur le sujet avant de pouvoir travailler sur, sur leur propre développement personnel. Okay. Thank you very much. There is another question to Claudia. How do you get men on board? That's another big question. Claudia would like to come in. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I'm certainly not an expert, um, but we had a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago with uh, Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, who's uh, one of the experts on the, on, the, on, the, on the subject, and she talked a little bit about that. Um, It's really about, you know, having conversations. It's like really naming what, you know, bringing it up, bringing up the, the issues in a constructive manner. Um, it's about framing. She talked a lot about how we frame the issues. You know, for a long time, um, 
uh, you know, these were where gender equality has been framed and thought about as women's issues. You know, it's the women that they're not uh, capable of speaking in public, that they're not promoting their work, that they're not, you know, sponsoring each other, that they're not doing this, that they're not doing that. And then, you know, we've seen in the last decades, you know, the plethora of women's networks and we've seen, you know, women getting, you know, worked up and doing all these things, taking all these steps, taking all these initiatives. And then, you know, still, you still keep on hitting against this crystal ceiling because the other side of the universe hasn't done that work of self-awareness that Valerie also referred to before. Um, so it's really, it's really about, you know, a conscious um, creating a space. And, and this is like, you know, both HR and leadership's uh, responsibility, creating a space for those conversations, creating a space for saying, you know, we have a problem here and we need to all collectively understand why. And, uh, and, um, and then yes, you know, training, trainings, uh, like Fran said, on constant gender bias and all this type of, uh, um, this type of trainings and, and, uh, and, um, and, and tools can help create an awareness. So it's about educating, discussing, um, and, but also for like leadership really doing their job. My honest opinion. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I also see a, a question is, uh, uh, what does it mean to be an empowered woman? Well, that's quite a, a general question. <laughs> but I don't uh, know. Well, I, I mean, what does it mean? Uh, I think that uh, in any case, at some point, if I may, you know, give an advice to my younger self, uh, <laughs> mm. I would say, you know, for me, it was about the moment in which I, I realized that I owned my career that I needed to stop being defined by my job title, my team size, my responsibility, my last promotion or whatever. Like those are just, you know, things, yes, they're important to our career development, but you know, to a certain extent, you know, you know, when I, when I finally decided say like, what do I want to accomplish? What is my life mission? Who, who am I, you know, and, uh, and uh, defining my own career on my own terms and then and, and you know and I'm, I'm devoted to it but then there's so many other dimensions that in men and women you know um, not only women like how do we become empowered it's like when you finally tap into your own resources and you understand what you're really good at and what you can contribute and then you know for me it has taken the shape of also participating in and taking part in a lot of um, professional networks outside of the organization both in a vertical and an horizontal sense, you know, vertical in terms of the industry, so professional networks within the industry to understand better, you know, what other companies are doing as well and connect better with other companies. But then also horizontal, you know, in my past, uh, I was a marketeer, so understanding better, you know, how is marketing and communications evolving. And those networks have been fundamental in providing me the role models that I didn't have in my daily job, for instance. So, um, that was, you know, that's been my experience, but I, I, I would strongly suggest that to anybody. Okay, thank you. Well, Valerie, uh, there's also a question for you. How is it in the top of Canal Plus? Are there more, um, in most uh, international broadcasts, it's still, it's still uh, the management is uh, masculine uh, dominated. How is it in Canal Plus? Are you one of the only women on the top or? Are there more? Do you feel lonely or do you have a lot of women colleagues? And the top, I mean, eh? Alors, dans le COMEX, hein, donc, nous sommes six femmes et donc il y a 30%, euh, on représente 30% des femmes. Donc je ne suis pas la seule et je ne suis pas isolée. D'autant plus que, euh, historiquement, il y avait surtout des femmes dans les fonctions euh, transverses, support. Mais aujourd'hui, on a des femmes euh, qui sont dans les, euh, dans les métiers, donc euh, qui sont patronnes euh, de business. Hein, et notamment, euh, la directrice générale du, du studio de Canal hein, euh, est une femme. Euh, mais ça reste, euh, voilà, ça, ça progresse. Nous n'en sommes pas encore à 50%. Et le directoire, lui, est uniquement masculin. Donc, euh, on est sur la bonne voie, mais euh, ça prend du temps. Et il faut aussi prendre le temps de faire émerger des femmes qui vont ensuite pouvoir progresser sur, sur le top management. Mais on y travaille. Donc, à chaque fois désormais qu'il y a un poste vacant, le directeur général, donc le président du directoire, Maxime Sada, nous demande d'identifier de, une femme et un homme 
de telle manière à pouvoir avoir euh, deux, deux candidats euh, naturels. On travaille sur les plans de succession. Mais c'est vrai qu'on part d'une un, situation déséquilibrée et on, les, euh, on la rééquilibrera euh, progressivement. Pas non plus demander aux hommes de partir pour faire de la place pour les autres femmes, donc c'est plus compliqué. Donc je ne suis pas la seule femme. Ok. Very good. <laughs> well, finally, Amal. Amal, uh, do you think there should be more quota in this? That's also a long-term debate. Should, should we force it a little bit more, like they do, for instance, in Norway? Uh, there are now a lot of debates in the Netherlands. They do it in uh, not in the media, but they do it in the, in the top 100 companies. In England, you have already quota, so to have to force companies to have more women, especially in the management. Is that a good thing? C'est vrai qu'il y a cette question constante de est-ce qu'il faut imposer des, des quotas dans les médias Personnellement, je crois que du point de vue de la forme, le quota peut être, peut être intéressant, mais ce qu'il faudrait plutôt, ce sur quoi il faudrait le plus justement miser, c'est surtout plutôt le contenu et donc miser plutôt sur la qualité au lieu de la quantité. Donc je suis un peu partagée sur, sur l'imposition des quotas. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I would say, let's go on. I hope you're still, I see there are only, I think, 10 people left. So there are 98 there, so that's quite good. <laughs> Less than 10%, but well, let's go on. We still have uh, three challenging speakers and we uh, can wrap it up. Uh, still to come is uh, Silvia Guterres from Spain, and Gozi Ucho Chuku and Ursula Wolfschlager from Wettcraft Production in Austria, and Louise McMullen, the head of policy of equity in the United Kingdom. Well, I would Hans, say, yes? Can I just uh, interrupt for, to make two announcements? Okay. Um, um, the interpreters asked the upcoming speakers if they have a microphone, if they could use it, because it makes the sound a lot clearer. Uh, for them to make the translation, so just in case you have one on hand. And, uh, and also, it's fascinating presentations, and uh, really thank you to all the speakers who've spoken already, but we are running behind schedule, so I will kindly ask uh, all the, um, the, the next speakers presentations. That would be great. Thank you very much. I'll leave you now. Yeah, it's always difficult in this virtual uh, surroundings to interfere. I don't want to be rude, but, but please uh, try to keep up uh, in the 10 minutes. Well, let's go quickly then to uh, Media Pro in Spain. Silvia Guterres Valdecantos uh, about diversity and uh, equality in uh, Media Pro. Okay, S Silvia, you can take it over. Gracias, Franz. ¿Se me escucha bien? Eh, yes. ¿Me escuchas bien? ¿Sin problemas? Good. Yeah. Perfecto. Bueno, antes de nada, quería agradecer a Daphne y al, y al equipo eh, la invitación por estar aquí, por presentar esta, este trabajo que estamos haciendo en MediaPro. Voy a ser y voy a intentar ser escrupulosa con los 10 minutos, así que no me voy a enrollar mucho. Quiero ir sobre... Eh, la practicidad de lo que estamos haciendo. Eh, quiero, sí, eh, eso sí, eh, presentar eh, quién es MediaPro, porque no todo el mundo lo conoce, si bien en España somos bastante conocidos. Eh, MediaPro, eh, si te parece, pasamos a la siguiente diapositiva. Es uno de los grupos audiovisuales más importantes de Europa. Tenemos presencia en todo el mundo y proporcionamos soluciones técnicas para crear y transmitir contenido audiovisual. Aparte del éxito, eh, se debe a la gran diversidad de actividades que realizamos, ya sea en creación de contenido, en producción y postproducción, con más de 12.000 horas anuales de, de producción de contenidos, eh, transmisiones vía satélite, derechos deportivos, consultoría, eh, marketing deportivo o incluso eh, desarrollo de espacios y experiencias interactivas. Una amplia diversidad que nos genera eh, multitud de casuísticas dentro de la casa. Eh, en cuanto a nuestro talento, somos más de 7.000 personas de, a lo largo de todo el, el mundo 
con más de 1.500 periodistas y otros más de 1.400 profesionales técnicos. Es un sector el nuestro, como ya sabemos, históricamente con una alta presencia masculina, que eh, lo que queremos es transformarla y en ello estamos. Uh, Pero ¿de dónde nace nuestro, nuestra diversidad o nuestro proyecto de diversidad en, en MediaPro? Pues nace a mediados de 2018, como podéis ver, eh, llevamos muy poquito tiempo trabajando en ello de una manera práctica y real y nace con una pregunta muy sencilla que nos hacen en el, eh, desde la alta dirección que es eh, ¿cuántos hombres y mujeres trabajan en la compañía? Con esta pregunta tan sencilla de responder, tan fácil y que solo había que dar un dato, una cifra, un porcentaje, lo que se genera alrededor de ella es toda una corriente en la que lo que buscamos con ahínco y con deseo es saber por qué teníamos esa desigualdad, esa disparidad en la presencia de mujeres y hombres. Eh, desde entonces, desde mediados de 2018, estamos trabajando en ello mediante, empezamos a hacer encuestas, reuniones, análisis de datos, como decía la compañera Valerí, tan importantes esos datos que nos muestren la realidad de nuestra compañía y con esos datos, con esos análisis, creamos nuestro primer plan de diversidad e igualdad para todo el grupo. Un plan que recoge medidas, principios, valores y cultura de la compañía, como también decía nuestra compañera, eh, que son básicos para poder, poder atacar esta nueva transformación de la compañía. Las dos primeras acciones que hacemos es, por un lado, eh, crear nuestro comité de diversidad, un comité de diversidad que está eh, generado, está compuesto por nueve personas, tres hombres y seis mujeres, todos miembros del consejo de dirección y que representan a las diferentes áreas de negocio en las que trabajamos. Es importante en este sentido escuchar también lo que las áreas de negocio piden, solicitan y reclaman. ¿no? Y en ese sentido el comité eh, escucha y por otro lado eh, plantea acciones para poder transformar la compañía. Por otro lado, el seg la segunda acción que era inevitable también era instaurar la figura de, eh, que condujera y coordinara toda esta transformación. Por tanto, durante 2019 también se crea eh, o se realiza el nombramiento de la responsable de diversidad e igualdad, que en este caso soy yo. Nuestro plan de diversidad eh, recoge principios y acciones agrupadas en diferentes ámbitos, eh, como pueden ser desde la selección de personal, la retribución, la conciliación familiar o la comunicación corporativa, entre otros. Para cada uno de ellos lo que hacemos es fijar acciones eh, que, que buscamos implantar para eh, mejorar siempre la paridad de género en el grupo. Que este es nuestro mayor eh, focus, ¿no? donde tenemos puesto nuestra mayor energía. Eh, algunas de las acciones que hemos eh, implantado en nuestro plan de, de diversidad las podéis ver en esta presentación, algunos ejemplos, pues por ejemplo, eh, asegurar la objetividad en los procesos de selección mediante una profesionalización de los mismos o analizar también y, y verificar periódicamente el mapa retributivo de la compañía eh, de modo que podamos ver eh, enseguida si existen diferencias salariales entre hombres y mujeres que no están justificadas. También, como punto importante dentro del plan de diversidad, hemos establecido una formación en sesgos inconscientes para aquellas personas que en algún momento durante su trabajo habitual pueden hacer procesos de selección, algo que creemos que es también clave, ¿no? poder eh, ser capaces de identificar y llevar a la conciencia esos eh, sesgos inconscientes que a veces podemos tener en y por otro lado, también establecer, por ejemplo, catálogo, un catálogo de medidas de conciliación entre la vida personal y la profesional. A lo del 19, que ha sido un poco nuestro año de, de estreno, 
hemos hecho eh, una serie, hemos implantado una serie de acciones, pero como hoy tenemos muy poquito tiempo, sí que me gustaría explicar brevemente tres de ellas. La primera de ellas es el plan eh, de mentoring interno, eh, la segunda es nuestro es del mapa retributivo y en tercer lugar el programa que hemos desarrollado para mujeres víctimas de violencia de género. El plan de mentoring es un, es un plan mixto, es un programa mixto en el que participan hombres y mujeres pero la eh, presencia femenina está sobre representada. En este caso, en este primer programa, eh, la representación de mujeres es un 70% frente al 30% de, de hombres. Lo que buscamos con este programa básicamente es algo muy sencillo, que es visibilizar el talento que ya tenemos dentro de la compañía. Lo que nos sucedía en muchas ocasiones es lo que denominábamos las mujeres en la sombra. ¿no? Tenemos muchas mujeres en la sombra con gran potencial y que lo que buscamos con este programa precisamente es sacar a la luz ese potencial, visibilizarlas de cara a la alta dirección de modo que lo que eh, hemos diseñado junto con una firma de consultoría especializada es un programa en el que una mujer y una alta dirección, una persona de la alta dirección, comparten durante nueve meses jornadas de trabajo en la que el mentor acompaña a esa mujer durante su desarrollo profesional. Es un programa que está teniendo muchísimo éxito, del que estamos muy orgullosos por la trascendencia que está, que está teniendo. El segun, la segunda acción eh, que hemos desarrollado durante 2019 con gran entusiasmo ha sido precisamente el estudio de brecha salarial. Cuando nosotros empezamos este estudio, en 2019, detectamos que la diferencia salarial general entre hombres y mujeres era de un 11%. Si bien es verdad que está por debajo de la media española, que es un 14%, seguía siendo muy alta y durante todo el 2019 estuvimos analizando e eh, intentando eh, reducir esa diferencia salarial. En 2020, en marzo concretamente, que hemos hecho el último informe periódico, nuestra brecha salarial se sitúa en un 6%, con lo cual hemos reducido un 5, en 5 puntos porcentuales nuestra brecha o diferencia salarial entre hombres y mujeres. Y básicamente se debe a una mayor incorporación de mujeres en puestos de dirección y eh, una mayor promoción de mujeres dentro de la casa. Eso son, nos, ha, nos ha ayudado muchísimo a posicionarlas en, otra, en otras franjas salariales. Por último, el, la última acción eh, de la que estamos eh, tremendamente orgullosos de haber implantado es la, la, eh, el programa o la, la guía de ayuda para mujeres víctimas de violencia de género. Es un programa que se ha establecido eh, para que aquellas mujeres de, de, de MediaPro que estén pasando por una situación de violencia de género y lo que hacemos es aumentar todos aquellos permisos o ayudas que ya la ley española recoge, pero nosotros, en nuestro caso, mejoramos, pues, pues por ejemplo, eh, mayores anticipos de, de nómina para hacer frente a, a gastos que puedan estar eh, necesitando, a, ayudas a fondo perdido, subvenciones para realizar mudanzas o preferencia absoluta para cambiar el puesto de trabajo a otro lugar, a otra provincia o incluso a otro país. Eh, y a partir de mañana nosotros tenemos un gran recorrido por hacer, casi que estamos en pañales en, en materia de diversidad, pero tenemos mucho entusiasmo y creemos que estamos consiguiendo grandes cosas en muy poquito tiempo. Nuestro reto principal sigue siendo la mejora de la, eh, de la presencia de mujeres dentro del grupo. Nos hemos marcado como reto, antes decía nuestra compañera Valerí, que eh, lo que no se mide no existe y, y estoy totalmente de acuerdo con ella. Nuestro reto en, 2000, eh, en 2025 pasa por mejorar en cinco puntos porcentuales la presencia de mujeres. Esto equivale a un 1% cada año en mejora y creemos que lo podemos conseguir. Por otro lado, nuestro, otro de nuestros retos pasa por eh, mejorar nuestra presencia de mujeres en puestos directivos. Actualmente, nuestro comité de dirección tiene una presencia del 43% de mujeres, con lo cual estamos en lo que conocemos como de paridad de género. 
eh, y queremos que ese mismo patrón eh, se repita en las direcciones eh, de departamento, en las direcciones de área, direcciones de proyecto, etc. Durante estos eh, últimos tiempo, tiempos es verdad que hemos mejorado muchísimo nuestra presencia, nuestra directora de comunicación es mujer, nuestra directora financiera es mujer, nuestra directora de contenidos audiovisuales es mujer, es decir, tenemos una, una buena base sobre la que seguir trabajando en este sentido. Y nada más, os dejo mis datos por si queréis cualquier consulta, duda, creo que tenemos un largo recorrido por hacer, pero creo que, que vamos, no vamos mal del todo. Okay, thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, well, I have just one question. How did the COVID-19 influence your work and this whole process? Because the impact in Spain is, of course, very big uh, the last month and probably will go on bueno, the next month. Uh... Es evidente que, que ha tenido un impacto. Yo eh, siento, o lo que estoy percibiendo es que es verdad que aquellas empresas, eh, bueno, que, que la COVID lo que nos ha permitido es diferenciar entre aquellas empresas en las que la paridad de género o, o la diversidad de género era un tema menor y para aquellas para las que sí que era un compromiso real. Es decir, la, la crisis de, de la COVID nos ha traído... Eh, muchas amenazas, pero eras, eran amenazas que existían, que estaban presentes. Lo único que, que nos ha hecho es visibilizar. Y en ese sentido, sí que es verdad que empresas donde la diversidad era marketing, eh, la agenda del día de diversidad ha caído totalmente. Y en aquellas en las que es un compromiso, lo que tenemos que hacer es transformar las acciones que teníamos planteadas y, con, eh, y cambiarlas por, eh, para intentar adaptarnos a los nuevos tiempos. Una de las cosas que a nosotros nos ha sucedido, por ejemplo, es que mmm, todos aquellos espacios comunes que habíamos eh, eh, pensado para los días sin cole, que, que tiene que ver con que una vez al año los niños, los hijos de nuestros trabajadores vienen a la compañía, hay que transformarlo porque ya no vale eh, ese tipo de actividades masificadas. Y, y ahí tenemos que hacer nuevas formas de pensar y la creatividad tiene que eh, ser el, el eje en el que, con el que se conduzca toda la diversidad de género. Así que es una oportunidad también de oro y hay que, hay que poder aprovechar esta mm. situación. Ok. But, uh, do you think it will be a setback that women, because many people have to stay at home, that that's happening in the Netherlands also, that there is a tendency that, that you have to take care of the children and, and mostly it are women again. Uh, well, what's your opinion about that? Sí. Sí, evidentemente habrá, habrá un cambio de paradigma. Y aquí sí que nos, creo que nos puede ayudar mucho el desarrollo tan espectacular que ha tenido el teletrabajo, el trabajo a distancia. Creo que tenemos que aprovechar esa circunstancia para no permitir que la mujer se quede atrás y sea otra vez la persona que se ocupa del cuidado de la familia. Tenemos una oportunidad y unas herramientas que hace 20 años no teníamos y tenemos que aprovecharlas. Ok, well, I would say bon courage there in Spain and I hope we all tackle this COVID crisis and uh, I wish you really uh, a lot of good health and a good success over there. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to uh, back, back to Baya. Oh yeah, I know you stay, of course. <laughs> We go now to Ngozi Uchuchuku from back to in the United Kingdom. Um, she's also uh, very active in the field of equality and diversity and they have set up an action plan uh, <coughs> for diversity in the theater and gozi are you there i i am here yes oh, very good <laughs> hello um so i just um i want to give you a bit of a background of what um why we've been fighting um and what we've been fighting for and then i'll go into some of the campaigns as well um, so I just want to give it why we've been doing this. So thank you very much for having me. Um, 
So yes, like you said, I'm from BECTU. Um, BECTU is a trade union for non-performance roles in the broadcasting and film um, industries. It also includes um, digital media, independent productions, and theatre and arts. So I'm um, representing the Black Members Subcommittee. Our two key principles um, are getting employers to undertake equality monitoring, set targets, target, publish that data, and um, with a specific focus on race equality and, and not just merging all of the equality um, quality groups together under the Equality Act 2010. Um, so we've been fighting for this for over 20 years um, to, to, to plan out to take action on diversity. Um, so um, well, <laughs> I want to give some background, like I said, um, and then I will um, explain about the campaigns. So for like the 40 years, we have had the Equal Pay Act, the Race Relation Act was introduced in, in the UK. So, and it's, it's quite disheartening that we still don't see diversity in the workplace. Yet we also know that the positive impact of diversity has been proven time and time again. So it's really why are we still talking about this? Um, if we nurture diversity in the workplace it, and embrace the differences in our population, we can ensure the supportive um, working environment for everyone, regardless of race, gender, class, creed and disability. So one of our biggest um, concerns is the failure of those in power and influence to recognise that they've not reached a point where positive action is no longer necessary nor uh, to recognise their responsibility to take action to make a change. Too often we still hear that ethnic minorities have failed to integrate um, the problem, but the problem is the film and broadcasting industries, not um, the lack of BME talent. Um, it's the failure of individuals uh, who, individuals who hire the workers or commission programmes to employ BME professionals. Um, to allow BME, BME, BME workers um, to work in areas other than the ones they pigeonhole them in. Um, uh, you know, you, you can only work on black programs. And in our industry, um, that is a lot of the jobs is on who you know, not what you know. Um, but it's also the result of the failure of funders and regulators to um, uh, regulators to take a lead. Uh, for decades, our current regulator in the UK, Ofcom, has failed to use its own powers to publish, to push broadcasters, broadcasting industries to take equality seriously. Um, in 2000 and, sorry, in 1995 to 2002, Ofcom's predecessor, the ITC, the Independent Television Commission, published equality, public, published equality monitored data for, for individual terrestrial companies, it licensed. The data showed that under transparency regime, um, ethnic minority employment among terrestrial broadcasters grew from 296 to, in 1996 to 555 in 2002. So that was an increase of 89%. Um, the licensees were required to supply this data um, under the ITC compulsory licensing conditions. So um, moving forward, Ofcom, its predecessor, um, from its inception in 2005, um, uh, uh, so they prefabricated and so they chose not to follow the ITC's um, example and decided to make equality monitoring requirements voluntary. Um, so by and they only changed that in 2000 and um, so three years ago so by doing that it gave the uh broadcasters a kind of a way a way out not to um not to focus on specific characteristic groups and just lump them all together so the consequences of that, the interventions that had been in place for BME workers, such as monitoring schemes, were widened out to take, to take in um, all underrepresented groups um, with uh, 
resulting numbers of places for actually specifically um, BME groups. So, uh, um, so, so it created alarming results in, in the data of the number of workers in the workforce. Creative uh, skill set data showed in 2013 um, the number of uh, creative media, sorry, showed that in the creative media industry, representation of women increased from 53,750 in 2009 to 69,590 in 2012. So women's representation went up by 27% um, of the total workforce in 2009. And um, this increased in 2012. Uh, so it reversed previous declines. However, over the same period, minority um, employment in the creative industry sank from 12,250 to 500 and, sorry, to 300. So over that six year, six year period, 2012, um, it, so it, it decreased by a shocking 31%. So while 6,000 6, women and 12 compared to 2009, 3,000 BME professionals left the industry. So, um, uh, so when uh, Ofcom finally published its data under pressure from the union, um, uh, it showed it showed that actually there's only four percent of freelance workers in BME who were BME. So we just thought, what's going on here? Uh, why is there an increase of women and a, such a decrease of BME employment? So the subcommittee, I'm going to stop with the science, that, that all the numbers are finished now. So um, the BME um, subcommittee uh, kind of like concluded that if employers do not have to focus on addressing underrepresented BME workers, um, but instead can choose which group they prefer to address, they're going to pick the easiest one women, white women. Um, so we, we believe that one of the ways to help increase the, um, the representation of the industry was to um, assist employers find BME professionals to hire. Can't find any and insist also to assist BME professionals to make contact. So we created um, a campaign and scheme called Move On Up. And this scheme that started running in 2003, um, and it gave professionals an opportunity to have one-to-one -one chats with executives, head of departments in the film and TV industry. Um, and over the 10 events that we ran, 6,000 meetings were set up uh, between 2,000 BME professionals and six, 800 execs across the broadcasting industry from radio, um, television and news um, and that resulted in workers getting jobs and furthering their career and we also took that model and worked with the professional football association and adapted it for their purposes so when the arts council um, started publishing their quality monitoring data for the hundred funded clients um, they worked with in 2005 after pressure from Beckton and fellow unions, it, in, 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 it showed that the theatres were not employing So we as a committee uh, could see the problem, but we also felt that we could provide a solution to that problem. Um, we, um, and we felt if we, got, if, we, if we got it right, this could affect um, this could have a wider impact on all protected characteristics um, such as race, gender, um, disability um, under the, the Equality Act in 2010 and it would also create a level playing field for everyone. Uh, so what is the Theatre um, Diversity Action Plan? It's a step-by-step -step practical guide for addressing diversity in the workforce. Um, it draws on existing good practices and takes um, employers through steps to creating a fair and a transparent recruitment procedure. Um, 
It sets out where you can find additional assistance if you need it. So in essence, the action plan brings all of good policies, um, the, what the law says under one document. Um, and we felt that if we could help the theatres because um, that the theatre industry comprises of small under-resourced companies with very small HR. Uh, and this was working before COVID. Um, we had uh, 131 theatres signed up um, for our plan across the United Kingdom and most of West End theatres. In addition, the committee um, set a partnership with the Department of Work and Pension and the Job Centres in London and also later in Cardiff. Um, and what we did was invited theatres to send all their job vacancies to one central point and they, that, that job centre sent, uh, encouraged the BME workers to apply for the jobs. You know, they weren't gonna, necessarily going to get the jobs, but it just exposed the theatres to more of a diverse workforce. And people did get, were getting jobs um, in the, um, the, the, the theatres. So just, I just want to, just to, to sum it up really, that it, it shows, our work has shown that if you, if you see the data, whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter, we can actually take action and make real change. Because it wasn't that the theatres didn't want to improve their diversity, they just didn't know where to start. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. But, but uh, Ngozi, it's not clear to me, did it really improve? You have this uh, diversity action plan. Do yeah. you see that, that there are more black actors or there are more people in the management? Or Yeah, well, well our, ours is behind the scenes, so we wouldn't have seen actors anyway. But it, it was, the problem is, it launched the beginning of this, yeah, beginning of this, end of last year, sorry. So, we were just, it was just taking off and like everything, COVID has kind of stopped it, but people were getting jobs behind the scenes through what we were trying to do, what we did. So, it, and it was, it, the key link was working with the Department of Work and Pensions and the job centres and linking up the, 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 um, the workers with the employers. So it, it, it was working and uh, it, it's just one of those things that, um, we, we won't see the full effect until we come out of this lockdown, but it was working, yes. Mm. And, and what is your opinion about uh, this news of yesterday that uh, the BBC invests 100 million uh, in, in diversity? After uh, 20 years of diversity policy, they do this. What is your opinion on that? Um, uh, it's, uh, I have to be careful <laughs> what I say, but... Um, I think it's a great thing, but it's, it's just very sad that it's come out of all of this stuff with the Black Lives Movement and internally having to readdress some of the issues that they've been, they've, they've been trying to over the years. Because I've, I've been involved, I work for BBC, so I know what they've tried to do over the years and, and it's just never been a real will. And I do feel that there's a real will to make a difference. Um, but it's not taking it, moving the money from what they're already doing to making, to actually, I suppose they're, they're putting the money where the mouth is. They're, they're backing the words with the money this time. Hmm. But I, are you uh, optimistic? I am optimistic. I, how can you not be? I think it's a positive thing for yeah. everyone. If, you can, if we can sort the diversity out for minorities of all sorts, it can only be a good thing. Do you know what I mean? For women, for, for disabled people, it, it can only be a good thing. I and mean, it's in the right, it's a right step, I think. Because yeah. I think the, the thing is, the BBC, once the BBC do it, other broadcasters will have to follow. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm saying this, maybe it sounds crazy from, from, from a Dutchman here, here in, in, in Amsterdam, but England has so many outspoken policies the last 20 years and diversity and and now you still have to come up with an action plan. I know, I know it's crazy. It is. It's. It's. I. I, I think we, we are still a bit scared to talk about race and still scared to talk about diversity because um, I'm disabled as well. So that you know, there's there's issues about disability that people are just scared to to address. Um, and I think I, I, I don't know why. I don't know why people just 
you have all these policies, you have the tools, you have the money, but they still don't want to do it. I don't know mm. the answer to that. Do you know? Yeah, no, I also <laughs> I, I really think you need, uh, like you said in your, your talk, uh, we still need the positive action yes. and we still need to focus on the business case. And I think uh, we still need to push it. it uh, otherwise, uh, it won't come by no, itself. It That's quite no, you, you know, it does frustrate me. So says, oh, we shouldn't have quotas and we shouldn't have this. But I think we need to have it to, 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 to allow to, for the door to be open. Yes, I want them to be gone. But until, we, until we're into that, in that place where we don't need quotas, we don't need targets. Stop thinking about the bottom line and actually think about the diversity of the workforce. That's, that's okay. just my opinion. <laughs> well, thank you, Ngozi. Thank you. I would say go on and uh, for another 20 years. Keep oh no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Yes, well, let's go uh, to Ursula Wolschlager from uh, what can be done to the diversity and the equality in the Republic in the Alps? Oh, <laughs> are you there? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi, 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 hi. Um, that's the last slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and thanks for all the in inspiring impulses that, uh, that we heard already. Thanks, Ngozi, especially. Um, that was really um, I am a uh, independent producer and uh, writer and curator. So in that position, I can already do a lot of um, a lot of work uh, as an individual, uh, um, supporting other women uh, filmmakers. I'm also a board member of several associations that fight for gender equality and I'd like to talk a little bit about the various initiatives we have advancing in Austria. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, FC Gloria is an association which has been existing for 10 years now. Um, it has the aim of enhancing the visibility of women within the Austrian film industry and to contribute towards a more gender equal future for the professional field of film. Um, regarding the numbers of our members, uh, we are one of the biggest professional bodies in the film industry in our country uh, or trade unions. <clears throat> FC Gloria is a group of individuals from all different professions in the film sector. Um, who have set themselves the goal of actively supporting and empowering each other and female film, film professionals in general. We are committed on many levels to safeguarding and promoting the interests of women in the Austrian film industry with a special focus on the areas of visibility, networking, film policy and information. For many, uh, we are seen as a role model because we've been a a around for so long and have been actively working in this field. Next slide, please. So what do we do? Ah, okay, this is supposed to say collecting, not molesting data. Um, we, are, um, we have done a lot of collecting data uh, by the so-called Swedish model, um, because as we've heard in many presentations so far, you have to have data in order to prove and show how big the misbalance really is uh, and be able to tackle it. We have evaluated the various public funds to see which amounts of subsidies went into hands of women and men, counting the positions of directors, screenwriters, and producers. After a while, um, the institution started to do this work themselves, uh, like the Austrian Film Institute and uh, the Film Fund Vienna, for example. And the Austrian Film Institute and the Austrian Federal Chancellor of Arts and Culture have uh, even commissioned a, a very, um, um, <clears throat> sensitive gender report. Um, so, um, and they've also started to take measures. Next slide, please. So that's some measures the Austrian Film Institute has taken. Um, one is the gender incentive. Uh, that's uh, a, fund, a special funding scheme um, to incentivize the, um, the, the production companies work with women directors and writers. Um, 
they have also um, started a, a script writing competition together with FG Gloria and the Drehbuch Forum, uh, the Script Forum. Um, it's called If She Can See It, She Can Be It. Um, and it um, uh, centers on complex women main characters uh, in, in, in the screenwriting competition. Um, it also has a, um, a pitching event attached that I will talk about a little bit later. Um, another pro project that uh, FT Gloria is doing together with the Austrian Film Institute is the Pro Pro Producers Program for Women. It's an initiative um, to empower um, women film, film producers. Uh, next slide, please. And it's a very international program. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been running, uh, it will be running for, for the fourth time in 2019, uh, we welcomed 20 international participants from 10 different countries like Norway, Switzerland, Slovenia, Luxembourg, South Tyrol, Serbia, Bosnia, um, and even uh, Mexico. Um, so together with international experts, the workshop supports women uh, producers to further develop their film projects and or company strategies, leadership skills, and career planning. Um, and it's uh, a one-week workshop followed by a mentoring phase. <clears throat> uh, it is also accompanied by, an, in, uh, by a sort of a congress where we use the mentors that we invite for the participants also for lectures, case studies, panel discussions and keynotes. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. FC Gloria also runs a mentoring program for women of all professions. Um, so that runs every year and everybody from the film, every woman from the film industry can, can apply and, and ask for a mentor. Um, we also have the FC Gloria Awards, which were awarded for the first time in 2018 in a glamorous ceremony. Then there's the Gloria Pool. Um, it's a free online database uh, of women uh, film professionals where everybody can look who think, thinks that there is no women working in this field, because that's what we hear a lot. Huh? So, um, FC Gloria also organizes regular cinema salons and panel discussions and cooperates with festivals and initiatives on events focusing on women in film. By now, these salons have established themselves as, a very popular, as very popular meeting places. Then we have uh, a, um, a campaign uh, with beer coasters. Um, we uh, design every year uh, five beer coasters with different motives that are printed every year. The beer co coasters, coasters have uh, facts and figures on them. Um, so we bring them to the table in order for people to discuss about these facts and figures. It's uh, launched together with the, our national film festival, Diagonale. And <clears throat> so it's in this, in this industry event where we launch these um, beer coasters and, and, and give people something to talk about. Um, then we have another project, which is a campaign for schools. It's called See It, Be It, and it's listing all professions in film with female protagonists on pictures. Um, actually, it's also used a lot by boys, we, we heard, because it's the, the only online platform that you can find where you have all the professions from, from, from the film industry. Um, so you can take a look, okay, what, what else could I be if I want to work in film? So the next slide, please. Uh, yes, so that's what some of our, that's the beer coasters and, and, and also the design for the, for the, for the awards. Next slide, please. Uh, here's also some of the beer pads and uh, some brochures for the See It Be It for the school program. Next slide, please. Uh, that's again this, this brochure from, for the school program. Uh, so you, you can see we also like a lot of uh, illustrations and, and, and multicolored pictures and so on. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, that's another in, um, uh, association that I'm, I'm a board member of. It's called Film Fatal. 
And while FC Gloria consists of women from all professions, Film Fatal Austria is a network only of women producers. Um, and the projects they launched, for example, is the Inclusion Rider, um, a, an addendum to contracts, a declaration of intent to support gender equality in the film and media industry, uh, which was already signed by 20 production companies and is being, uh, can be downloaded from, from the Austrian funding bodies. So, um, so, so producers can declare um, a, a, a lot of um, um, statements, how they, they will work in their professional field, in their uh, own production company in order to, to, to uh, help um, gender equality. <clears throat> then there's some uh, pitching events, um, for example, during the or after the, the screenwriting competition where uh, we um, invite women producers to have a first look on the project and give them kind of a head start. Um, also, it's, it's a very powerful tool in finding new matches and, and uh, um, support um, uh, women filmmakers from, from various sides. Um, and another initiative is, is, um, is uh, at the moment, um, uh, Film Fatale is running a study for the compatibility of film work and family duties. Um, to introduce some initiatives um, into uh, the filmmaking process um, um, to make it easier for people who have children to work in film professions. Next slide, please. So despite all these um, efforts, things are moving too slowly. The backlash has come again and again, and even the corona crisis will be bring a big so therefore, we think to re see real structural change, we need a quota system for the allocation of funds. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ursula. But, but uh, it, uh, in the end, uh, because I think you have wonderful initiatives and you're doing so much, but in the end, it sounds like uh, it's quite difficult and it goes very slowly, like I think we have in many European countries, eh? especially in the gender question and the cultural diversity question. Yes, I think it's going too slowly. It's, it's, um, we are, of course, it is helping a lot. Um, I mean, there are the, 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 the figures, are, um, but then the next backlash comes and, and it's about money as well. You know, it's about who has the power, who gets the money. And there's a lot of um, discussion about that. And after all, the money we're talking about here is tax money that needs to be allocated. I think um, the quota is really the only thing that, that will bring a real equality. Mm. But is there a, a, a majority in uh, Austria for that? You have, of course, this conservative, yeah, Green Party government who will probably will be quite divided about this topic. Um, we're working on it. Yeah, we're working on it. We there. Oh. I think we're losing Ursula. Well, Ursula, you, yeah, probably. I think. Well, we cannot um, wait for this. So. Well, that's really a pity. Well, okay. Well, then uh, let's go on to our uh, last speaker, Louise, Louise McMullen. Louise, are you already there? Is your connection quite well? Louise is from England, the head of policy of equity in the United Kingdom. Hi, friends. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yes, yes, we hear you quite well. I'm sorry, uh, Ursula, but. Uh, Maybe you can, we can hear you later. Well, I would say, uh, let's go on to your presentation, uh, Louise. No problem. If you need to go back to Ursula afterwards, um, I'm, very, okay. I'm very happy yeah. to just uh, crack on and, and do my presentation to get it done. Um, so as you've just said, I'm representing um, Equity UK. So we are the trade union for, um, we represent around 48,000 creative workers. Um, the majority of them are actors, but we also represent theater directors, 
designers, choreographers, dancers, comedians, um, and a whole swathe of um, other professions in the um, live performance sector and in the audiovisual sector. Um, I'm going to uh, talk for a few minutes about um, our work here in the UK um, following the, um, the spate of revelations that came out of the Harvey Weinstein um, uh, revelations back in 2017. Um, and I just want to, to sort of um, move on to talk more broadly about some of the initiatives we've now put in place um, to tackle harassment more generally, um, bullying and, and other related fields uh, uh, of equality work, including a little bit on mental health, um, because it ties in very closely um, to um, uh, a lot of those, um, a lot of those incidents and a lot of those behaviours. So uh, going back to 2017, um, and as we all recall, um, whenever uh, the, the story started breaking um, about um, Harvey Weinstein, there was a huge tide of um, revelations from um, a lot of women across the industry um, and, some, and some men um, and um, LGBT plus workers, disabled workers um, and black workers too. Um, from our position as a trade union, kind of doing um, the triage work on cases coming forward, to be quite frank, we were overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed by the tide of revelations um, and the nature of the things that we were told. Um, some, uh, some stories from our members um, had uh, involved a criminal element. We, you know, we must remember that, that a, a lot of what happened to people in our industry were criminal acts. There were, there were assaults of, of, various, of various forms. And a lot of revelations were historical in nature. Some people were coming forward telling us things that had happened to them 20 years ago. Um, and I should also say, without, without, with preserving confidentiality as well, that, um, that those behaviours penetrated the whole of the industry. Um, mm -hmm. People who um, you may perceive to be in um, weaker positions of power, so new entrants, um, drama school students, but we also heard from people who may be perceived to be more powerful in the industry. So um, women who find themselves in very pre precarious positions um, in casting situations, for instance. So this was something that touched a lot of people across the industry. Um, for many, many years, through um, our collective agreements and through our workplace organisation, um, our organisers at Equity have tackled um, uh, all forms of, of all forms of harassment that take place in the workplace, and have um, taken on cases and fought cases on behalf of individual members and groups of members. But what we were facing in 2017 was a massive call, and quite rightly so, for systemic change to start in the industry, and for the wrongs of the past to be confronted, and for the union and for the industry as a whole to come up with a plan for the future that would, that would challenge this behaviour and bring about change. So with, within Equity, um, uh, our, our Vice President at that time, and she subsequently became elected as our President, Maureen Beattie, who is an actor of, of many, many years standing, she got together a group of members from within the union uh, representing different kinds of um, working experiences. So she brought together um, uh, representatives of our, of our young members, our student members, our deaf and disabled members, um, black and ethnic minority members, and LGBT plus members. And she created the Sexual Harassment Working Group. And alongside this um, working group, the, um, the Union ran a survey of members uh, to come forward with suggestions for good practices that, that the union could um, look at alongside industry partners and stakeholders across two months of evidence gathering to come up with what, what was then published as our Agenda for Change report. So this report basically set out a roadmap for how we, how we, how we saw the future of the industry, how it could be and what changes we needed to see. And the the recommendations of that report included some questions that we had to ask ourselves as a union. You know, were we really representing our women members properly? Were, were some of the were some of the behaviours out there in the industry at that time? Because you know, we as a union or um, as an industry had not tackled fundamental questions about portrayal, about pay, and about power imbalances. 
Um, we also we looked at a whole range of areas, including um, how, what what we could do to better support students, uh, because we were finding that an overwhelmingly common story from young people coming into the industry was that they had already experienced kind of that normalization of um, poor behavior. They had experienced it in their training establishments. Um, and I must say the, the problem appeared to be incredibly acute for our LGBT plus young members and for our um, black and ethnic minority members. Their, their experiences at drama school um, uh, appeared to be incredibly problematic and there was specific work that we needed to do there. And we also had to work with um, a, a number of different sort of external partners, including um, the UK's conciliation service, to try and come up with um, proper robust guidance on um, sexual harassment in the workplace. And also trying to apply that to, to the entertainment industry situation where there's, uh, you know, a huge reliance on informal networks. There's a lot of like interpersonal relationships. Uh, there's a lot of touchy feely behavior that to people seems quite normal and natural and, and a good thing. Um, but it was about trying to help our members establish where their boundaries are and helping them, them to identify when something's not quite right and when it should be actioned and, or when you should come to your union for support. So we also worked with um, the Metropolitan Police to try and come up with um, some solutions to give our members confidence and also to give the, the staff working for equity confidence whenever a really serious matter like an assault comes forward to, to one of our staff members how we can progress that in a way that doesn't frighten our members and actually empowers them um, to, to try and seek some justice where, where that is the appropriate route. And we also worked with um, a range of um, employers groups and engagers groups, including um, the British Film Institute to, to come up with um, new codes of conduct for, uh, across the industry um, and to put in place where there weren't before some good dignity at work policies. And, um, and I must say that the coverage of some of those dignity at work policies is, is a lot broader than it was in the past. And that's, that's been a real achievement of this, of this campaign and this process. Um, for us as a union, it, was, um, it became um, uh, increasingly apparent that sexual harassment and harassment more broadly had been feeding into a trend in the industry um, which was very, very troubling, and that was um, the increased uh, prevalence of mental health issues. Um, so a, a colleague of mine, Louise Granger, she actually in the last year has set up a number of um, very heavily resourced and very, very effective um, professional support mechanisms for our members where they can access um, professional um, counselling, um, and psychiatry services and there's a 24-hour dedicated helpline not just for people experiencing workplace har and harassment and bullying but also for people who um, are experiencing mental mental health difficulties they can get the help that they need it's quite stark in our industry that um, uh, all workers across the, the sort of creative and cultural industries in the UK have a 20% higher risk of suicide and for women it's a 69 percent higher um, risk of suicide so that's something that was very important um, for us to broaden out our agenda for change campaign and to encompass that element of mental health because it very clearly seemed to be a corollary of uh, of uh, of the harassment crisis the kind of the the most visual aspect of how we took forward the agenda for change report though was the safe spaces campaign so this was a very, very um, high profile campaign that we uh, rolled out in workplaces um, and also through the equity website. And I'm going to, at the end of my presentation, I'll pop a little link into the chat box so that people can go and check out in their own time. So what we've got there is a range of different resources, including literature for workplaces, um, information booklets on how to uh, advance a complaint of bullying and harassment, um, how to get in touch with all the different um, uh, staff of the union and external helplines and other um, resources. We um, also have um, published in the last year a, a specific guide for members who have experienced stalking behaviour which is a real issue for a lot of performers in particular. Um, and that's something that, you know, uh, again, addresses something that is very much a workplace issue, but also, you know, kind of straddles the, the, the criminal justice system as well. So that's been something that um, 
was a little tricky to get off the ground, but very much needed and appreciated by our members. One of the um, one of the most popular elements of the Safe Spaces campaign is um, a, a statement which um, uh, our members and, and particularly Maureen, our president, crafted together. And that's something that's quite frequently read out on day one of rehearsals if you're working in a theatre or in a film and TV set. And it basically what it does is it, it gets together everyone working on a particular project and it establishes ground rules for mutual respect between people and also reiterating that um, we will have in our workplace a zero tolerance approach to any form of bullying or harassment and that we will base our interactions with each other um, on a more professional footing and, and act with kindness towards one another. So that's something that's been very, um, very popular amongst our members and we've um, had very good traction um, uh, for that statement and it's been promoted very heavily by quite a few of our high profile members who some of my colleagues have filmed delivering the statement and, and again it's available on the web link that I'll pop up in just a moment. Um, so that was kind of where the campaign uh, travelled from late 2017 through to, to sort of round about now um, and I'd say where we're at now as an organisation and kind of where we're at more broadly in the UK is very much a mixed picture. Um, we certainly feel more confident as an organisation dealing with individual instances of, of harassment in the workplace whenever, whenever they appear, whenever someone rings us up or whenever a case is referred to us. And that's a good thing. Um, our members certainly feel more confident that something will be done if they approach, if they approach their union. And that's great. But the reality is more broadly, incidents still happen a lot and across a number of different sectors. I think it's quite interesting actually that um, once I'm done with this seminar, I'm going off this evening to talk to a group of professional female wrestlers who in the last week have taken to social media to um, call up historical and more recent cases working with this group of women trying to establish leaders and trying to take forward some dignity at work and campaigning with them. But, you know, they're not the only ones. We've also heard from dancers. Um, we've heard from um, women and male comedians as well about some of their experiences. So there's still a lot that we need to do. And sometimes we feel very much like we are chipping away at a massive societal problem rather than a, you know, a sectoral issue that we can win or lose. Um, Things that are more positive though, and there is a lot that is positive out there right now, is you can see a real generational shift in terms of, the, of a zero tolerance attitude towards um, bad behaviour, either in drama schools or in workplaces. And I think one of the things that's really struck us lately, and particularly as the Black Lives Matter movement has, has gained momentum in a number of countries, is that here in the UK, it has emboldened quite a few of our young members and existing current student members and past student members to, to organize, to, to, to call out the, the, the things that they have experienced. And as a result, it has brought change in certain institutions more recently. Um, and, and I really hope that that's something that is lasting change and influences a lot more institutions. One other thing, um, just, to, just to finish on as well, in, in, um, in our sector that I think is really positive is that there um, we have embraced the role of intimacy directors and you know that's got that's got, got kind of a, a, a double effect on the one hand there's um, an issue of safeguarding in workplaces and it's really great that you can call on a resource such as an intimacy director to make your workplace feel safe as a performer but I think also accepting that um, intimacy direction and intimate scenes require some more resourcing or some more thought is actually a step forward in terms of respecting performers as workers and as professionals who you know just freely take off their clothes and, and ought to be exploited on, on that front but they actually deserve to be treated with respect and with care and I think that that's something that has that has moved along particularly in this sector and is very impressive where, where we'll be going from here as a union is, um, and in the context of the COVID crisis, which I know you've asked a lot of speakers about, is we'll be pushing very, very hard to make sure that the government do not backslide on the commitments that they have made, particularly in the area of employment rights. We've been promised that they will look at the time limits for making complaints 
we've been promised that they will look at non-disclosure agreements and trying to limit when they can be used. Um, and there has also been a promise that they will look at um, uh, introducing a new duty on employers to uh, make them take steps to ensure that workplaces um, prevent any harassment of, um, of employees and workers. So those are our next steps. And arguably that's going to be the, the trickiest part of the agenda, getting some of those legal changes through, because again, that will provide the framework hopefully bringing about that ambition we've got of, of long-term behavioural change. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Quite impressive, I think, for this last uh, contribution. But I still have one question. Do you think, because like here in the Netherlands, it's still quite rare that people speak out. It's still quite rare that there are court cases. Uh, it still is a taboo. I know you have Harvey Weinstein and, and, and you would you have your Prince Andrew, who, who <sighs> my God, uh, his strange role. I won't give any command on that, but, but do you have the idea that more people, uh, more women or more harassed people speak out in Britain now? That is a that is a really good question. Um, we do we we have some activists who we've been able to point to and say, okay. Um, so a few years ago, a member of ours, Helen Vine, she challenged her employers. She went through the tribunal process and she got ten thousand pounds, which demonstrated that not only was she harassed at work, she faced sexual discrimination, and her experience is the experience of the thousands of women in our industry. So they should all speak up. And, and her experience also was that she didn't suffer any detriment to her career going forward speaking up. She just really exposed her behavior that needed to be exposed. Um, but what's, what's a difficulty is that I only have a handful of examples like her to point to. There aren't enough people coming forward at the moment. And again, I think that is because we really do need those um, legal changes. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an organiser by heart and by, and by profession, so I like to think that we can places or in society, but, but we really do need, I think, some of these legal rights to be strengthened so that people can have faith in, in the processes that are there to deliver justice for them, I'm afraid. And, and I think also in the context of having the kind of government that we've got um, and the recent changes to who the Prime Minister is, it doesn't give women all that much confidence in terms of stepping up and speaking out they do they do worry about the context that they're doing that in mm. yeah and in the juridical system it looks like the reaction is quite weak there's still not yeah again like your prince andrew mm. it, there are so many evidences but no one acts so then it's in my view it's not a good example to speak out if you, if you you think well what will happen they will come away with it. It's sad to say, but yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. It's not really an optimistic <laughs> end of our meeting, but let's, I think it's quite good you have this Safe Spaces uh, project. That's really something that should be everywhere in Europe, that there should be places where you can go, where you can speak out at least, uh, and it should be in companies, I think. It's uh, because th especially, you have the harassment, but the bullying, it's something that happens in every company, especially in media, where there is so much deadlines, where there's so much uh, quick decisions, where people don't want many debates. Uh, so I see it also here in my company. Bullying is really something which is going on everywhere. And in my view, it has to be stopped. So uh, I would say we all encourage your work. <laughs> well, thank you for your uh, contribution. Uh, Daphne, I think uh, there is not much time anymore for a Q&A. Eh? I also see there are not so many questions. Um, no, so indeed, Franz, thank you. We, we don't have many questions and we are running out of time. We promised uh, interpreters anyway, we'll wrap up uh, at five. So, um, so I think we'll have to, to close the discussion now. Um, thank you so much, Franz, for your, for, for your efforts and for keeping everything together. Thank you and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I will ask uh, our speakers whether they um, agree uh, to share their PowerPoint and if they do I will uh, circulate them after the event.
And I also wanted to remind all the participants that um, a lot of the campaigns, actions, websites, tools that were presented during the meeting are in the handbook and that there is a website where the handbook can be downloaded in many languages and I will share, send you the link. So um, I will now give the last words uh, uh, to uh, Isabel Doshi from uh, the European Broadcasting Union and Pamela from the European Federation of Journalists to close the meeting. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm delighted to have participated to the inspiring session and I would like I would like to thank France for the moderation. I also would like to thank um, the European Commission and more particularly DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusions for the continuous support. I also would like to thank the social partners and the members in, their, in, the, in the audiovisual sectors for their continuous commitment to promote gender equality and diversity. Um, we have attended a very interesting session where the importance of data, KPIs, um, have been um, highlighted and also the importance of making women's work more visible and the importance also to, um, uh, to um, raise awareness to debunk gender bias. Um, the social partners in the audiovisual sectors are committed to keep uh, promoting gender equality and diversity in the sector. And against this background, I would like to invite you to connect to a webinar, which will be organized by the European Broadcasting Union on the 17th of September, which will deal with um, um, gender pay gap, work flexibility, and also toxicity at workplace. So please join us. But before, I will give the floor to Pamela Morinier, who works at the European Federation of Journalists and who is an expert in gender issues. Pamela, back to you. I think we can't hear you, Pamela. If I'm not mistaken. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, yeah. And sorry about that. Um, together with Isabel, we wanted to thank you, Daphne, very much for all your work on this. It was not just only coping with a, a group of uh, social partners with uh, different perspectives to things, but it was also all your, the hard work that you've been doing on this handbook, which I strongly encourage you to read and use uh, because it has this legislative background that we need sometimes to fight. It has some very useful statistics and of course it, it compiles a whole list of best practices that can apply to the different sectors, uh, to the different industries and um, I, I hope it's going to be very useful for the future. Um, as we heard today, data is fundamental. Claudia said uh, very rightly, it takes emotion away. Um, I think it helps also to identify discrimination very accurately, and we need more of those data. So I strongly encourage all participants to, to support us in, uh, in the work that we've been doing with the social partners and push for more statistics um, across the industry. Uh, we need to change mindsets. And uh, this goes with bringing together women, men, uh, people from minority backgrounds and uh, audiovisual uh, leaders together. Um, uh, how can we do this by starting a conversation? Also by uh, setting policies together. Uh, policies cannot be uh, a from the leadership directly to the staff. This is a joint work. So we need to include uh, everybody in the setting of these policies. Um, as social partners, we will continue to promote gender equality and diversity. It's been a, an amazing experience for all of us to work together on this issue. And I would like to thank um, the partners, Elena and uh, Liana from CEPI, Benoit from FIAP, Derval from FIA, uh, Richard and Daphne from Unime, Thomas from FIM, uh, Grégoire and Monica from ACT, Isabel from EBU, Francesca and Marie-Pierre from AE. 
uh, here are uh, the radios. And um, last but not least, this webinar is been, has been recorded and it's going to be available. So if you want to watch it again, if you want to uh, review some of, uh, watch again some of the parts of this webinar, you're, you're most unwelcome to do so. Thank you very much and have a good end of the day.